Et on fait une petite pause à quel moment euh... Alors du coup le planning tel qu'il était, c'était euh, donc Pierre Yves, enfin, Pierre Yves will start with a short introduction to the Flowers Group. Uh, then Francesco with a short introduction on the, the work they are uh, doing at the Pasea Lab. Uh, then I will do also a short introduction to the Origin Project. Uh, and then it's a bit arbitrary, but uh, then I propose that it would be like Luke uh, and Daniel and their respective works. And uh, we conclude with uh, Eleni and Tristan and uh, also uh, their respective works uh, afterwards. And so we can do, uh, so it's, I think it's seven talks, so we can maybe do a pause at the end of the fourth one, which would be then, uh, I think, after you. Okay. There is a kind of program that I sent uh, earlier in the week. Thank you. Maybe just some words about the context of this uh, meeting. So, uh, so in the flower team, also for people maybe that are not from uh, from flower that I am. Uh, the flower team has been uh, more and more interested actually in uh, the relevance of uh, cultural models in artificial intelligence and how to uh, model artificial agents that can take advantage of cultural knowledge, but also that can create some sort of cultural knowledge. And so in this context, uh, Pierre-Yves uh, recently contacted uh, Francesco Derrico, who is leading a lab uh, in archaeology uh, in Bordeaux. Uh, working actually on cultural evolution, um, in human evolution, or in the human species in general. Uh, so we had the first meeting a few weeks ago, of just to to uh, know each other and to discuss a bit. And this is where the idea of having this meeting, where we can enter a bit uh, in more detail in what we do respectively, uh, started. So here is. Uh, Thanks, uh, Clément, for the for the introduction. So, um, and also thank you to the whole team uh, uh, from uh, PASEA, we say that, uh, for coming. It's, it's a great opportunity for us to, to learn a lot and to be inspired. And, uh, and, and, and maybe we've already seen that there are, there are uh, general uh, common interests and maybe uh, at some point we can find more practical ways to to put this common interest into uh, concrete things, but uh, but today let's let's just enjoy uh, discussion at the start. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, and I'm trying to I'm going to try to to, to keep short. Um, I'm going to present a, a general overview of the topics in which uh, we've been working in the team, um, and in a domain that we like to call developmental artificial intelligence. I'm going to explain uh, in a minute what we mean by this domain. Um, and maybe before talking about that, it may be useful to understand um, one of the pathways uh, in which we came into those topics, especially Clément and myself. Um, some time ago, uh, relatively long time ago, uh, both of us were working um, on uh, developing models of the origins of and the evolution of speech. For example, trying to understand uh, how human population uh, can come to form uh, systems of vowels, of consonants, of syllables uh, that have uh, properties such as the one we observe in human languages. So there are a number of regularities. Some vowels, consonants, and syllables are very uh, frequent, and there are also diversity. There are no two languages which have the same set of sounds, and uh, some some languages use a system of sound that are very uh, very rare. Um, and so we wanted at the same time to understand uh, why they, they are. There, are, there is a duality between uh, regularities and diversity, why there are such regularities, and even more basically, how a population of individuals can come to agree on a, of a system of sound without having some kind of uh, general chief of the sound of a population, which is going to say, okay, starting from next week, next week we are going to use these vowels and this consonant, and that's it. Uh, because obviously that's not the way it's been going. And so, um, we were working on a family of models uh, uh, that were developed uh, 
uh, around 20 years ago uh, uh, by people like Luke Steele and Simon Kirby and others, so called language models, a language game. And language games were actually themselves a model inspired from concepts from uh, uh, philosophers like uh, Quinn and others. And the idea was that we were trying to understand what kind of little uh, uh, interactions between uh, agents in a population of individuals um, that are decentralized, so like each interaction is about between two people or between three people, but they don't have a global view of what's going to happen in the population. And to try to understand how local interaction could, in, in language could give rise to global structure. And so in the case of uh, the origins of speech and vocalization, we were trying to play with things like imitation games, like one guy doing producing a vocalization and the other one uh, trying to imitate the vocalization and based on the quality of the imitation they would update um, their internal representations which is going to, to change at the same time what they will vocalize later on and how they will represent and perceive sounds later on. And initially in those models uh, vocalizations and uh, uh, internal representations were completely random and we were working on a number of uh, of mechanisms to understand how, uh, starting from random vocalization, the population could kind of crystallize toward the set of vocalization that are composed of the same vowels, of the same consonant, and with similar properties as the one in uh, humans. And so those models were actually quite successful, and for vocalizations, for lexicon, for grammar, for syntax, there are a number of uh, well-known uh, properties of human languages that could be uh, 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 reproduced or, or, or predicted. Um, and so uh, at some point we began to ask, okay, what are the, the main ingredients in these models that, that, that lead, lead to these results? And there was one very important ingredient uh, that was more or less present in all of those language game models. And it was that um, agents were kind of systematically wanting to communicate with each other uh, and to explore a variety of communication situations, a variety of communication signals, uh, and, and kind of they, want, they were very motivated to play those games. And if you remove this motivation, they don't play, and if they don't play, they just uh, don't uh, discover and negotiate any kind of language. And so one of those questions was where this motivation for playing language games came from. Uh, was this something that might be like kind of specific to language and maybe in the evolution of humans evolved at some point, or might this be more something more general, uh, a more general propensity to play and to, uh, to explore the body and the environment for, uh, uh, through some form of general form of curiosity, and maybe they would explore the vocal tract just like they explore their body, just like they explore how to play with objects. Uh, and this is what led us to, to really uh, try to investigate the question of, um, of development, because then this question, uh, you can translate it, okay, but, but, but then in babies, uh, as they develop today, what happens? Maybe this can be an inspiration from, from the prerequisite that we, we, we have in those games. Um, and so what, what leads babies, for example, to develop some form of open-ended development uh, repertoire of skills, uh, a, motor, a repertoire of motor skills, a repertoire of uh, sensory skills, of language skills, of social skills of many kinds, they learn to do mathematics, they learn to do music, and, 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 and this, this repertoire uh, increased with time. Um, and so this is what progressively led us to, to, yeah, to this question about what is the engine uh, of the open-ended development in, in individuals, which is going to, to pull them to play themselves alone and with others. Uh, and then this is what led us uh, back to the initial question, what's the role of curiosity? Uh, in child development and, and how curiosity might interact with language acquisition. Uh, how it might be uh, a precursor or an engine or a motivator for language acquisition and how vice versa the acquisition of language can power in some ways uh, curiosity driven exploration of the world. So that's basically the, the, the main idea of what we've been doing for many years and we've been doing that from several perspectives. One perspective is, is to develop models that aim to help us understand a little bit better humans. And so in recent years, we've been trying to understand better the, the individual development of children within a social world. Uh, but this relates, as I just explained, to the more general development of culture. We've then, we've then tried to transpose some of those uh, mechanisms we observe in humans to, to machines, 
to be more autonomous machines, more flexible machines. And we've been working on a number of applications in different domains, but one of the most prominent ones is uh, education. How can those new models of learning and curiosity help us build tools that help ch children learn better? Uh, and so uh, we've been basically ex exploring two fundamental ideas. I'm just going to, to summarize them again, but quickly. First fundamental idea uh, in, in uh, everyday language, we could say that children are, are like little scientists driven by curiosity to explore the world and make a model of the world. And so for doing this, they are equipped with several kinds of mechanisms. One kind of mechanism we've been exploring a lot is, is what we call autotelic learning, uh, which is the ability to invent one's own objectives, to invent one's own goals. Uh, and then a relative capability is among all the set of goals that one can invent, how to select the one we are going to do and to explore at a given point in time and in a certain order. And so for this, we've been looking at uh, how the brain might attribute uh, more interest to certain kinds of goals and learning experiences than others. For example, developing the, what we call the learning progress hypothesis, basically stating that what the brain likes to explore, or the kind of problem the brain likes to explore, are problems for which it is experiencing learning progress, like for which it is subjectively feeling that there is progress in some sort that is being made, which means that problems that are easier, are either too difficult and no progress is made, or too easy and no progress is made, are not so much interesting. This is the, the problems that are initially somewhat difficult and you make progress that are most most, most interesting. And so basically, for example, if you have in an abstract space a curve like depicting the, the evolution of the performances to solve a problem, basically it's kind of the derivative of this curve, which is kind of uh, the signal the brain uses to, to, to decide what's interesting to explore in priority. Uh, and so we've been using this, these ideas, for example, to model uh, the evolution of speech sounds, so sorry, the development of speech sounds in the individual. Uh, and so this is the, the work actually uh, Clément led a number of years ago, uh, and he was describing uh, during noon, uh, trying to understand how such models of curiosity can lead a, ba a simulated uh, baby vocal learner uh, to go through a number of vocal stages that share statistical properties with what we know in, in, in human children, and especially a major transition around six months, where after a few stages which are basically universal, uh, and are not influenced by a surrounding language, around uh, six, seven months old, the, the vocalization become to be influenced by the social environment in a way that, that is relatively structured. Uh, we've been doing similar studies for the development of tool use, where there are a number of people in psychology that have identified the number of stages uh, with weird properties, and we've tried to explain some of them through the same models of curiosity-driven exploration. And also those models, we're not, we not kind of studying them by trying to reproduce things we, we already know in observation of our, our lab experiments, but we also use them to make new predictions of what humans would do. Uh, for example, uh, what humans would do when you, you give them a number of games where they can learn things, and you, the only instruction you, 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 you say to them is, you, you have uh, one hour to play with those games. You are free to, to, to use the time you want on the, on the game you want, to switch whenever you want. And we try to explain the structure of their exploration based on those models. And so we've been able to, to validate aspects of those models by this kind of experiment. And then uh, today it's not the topic, but we've, we've transposed some of those ideas to build like more flexible machines. Um, and we've, we've been working on educational applications, for example, trying to personalize the sequences of learning uh, activities uh, that children uh, encounter in order to maximize at the same time their motivation and the learning efficiency. Uh, and we will actually also use some of those techniques, uh, but that's also another topic, um, uh, to build machines that help scientists to make new discoveries. It's uh, basically curiosity-driven uh, scientific assistant in a way. And then more recently, the second fundamental idea we've been uh, uh, exploring, uh, this is what I, I was saying initially, is that um, language uh, and culture in general is uh, not only uh, a mean to communicate, that's also a mean to think more abstractly. 
it, it's been, it, it is used by humans today and, and a long time ago as a way to imagine in a more abstract way to create, uh, to make mental simulation uh, of the world, to plan, etc. Uh, and these are, these are ideas that have been developed by many people, including Vygotsky and Brunner, from which we are very much inspired. And so we've been developing a number of models recently exploring this idea uh, that uh, after being first learned as a tool to communicate through social peers, uh, the social interaction and the structure of social peer, the language in particular, is internalized, like, 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 like individuals making internal models of what social peer would say, what feedback they would say, what, uh, uh, what reaction they would have uh, if they would be there, when you would do that, and they use that as a cognitive tool to, to guide their, uh, their exploration and their creativity. And later on in the day, we will have a presentation by Tristan, who is remotely present, exploring uh, one of these works uh, that we done recently on those topics. And uh, we've been, for example, working on related topics like how individuals can learn to ask questions using, using language to access new information that they need to solve some problems. Uh, we've been working on educational application of this idea, how can we use language to empower children uh, to, to, have, to have cognitive tools to express their curiosity and to develop their curiosity. Uh, in various contexts, for example, helping them to ask, uh, to, uh, developing their skills of curiosity, curious question asking. And then here we are discussing about how language and culture can be helpful as a cognitive tool, but we are also investigating how agents can create, uh, participate to create, and, 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 uh, and enrich the culture in which they are embedded. And so we are now again uh, coming back to the language model that Clément and I were working on uh, a long time ago, reusing this more recent work that we've been using, and so this is, for example, uh, giving us new insights uh, on, on, some, uh, on some topics. Uh, then, for example, and this will be a presentation uh, from uh, Eleni later on in the afternoon, we are studying, for example, what's the role of the social structure uh, in uh, enabling collective innovation. Uh, so that's a kind of uh, collective uh, exploration. Uh, and then uh, uh, in, the, in the presentation of Clément, he will go into more depth, into a systemic view of the interaction between the scale of individual development and the scale of uh, cultural evolution and biological evolution. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to stop there. It was just a way to give you some kind of first uh, global picture of the topics uh, on, which we, on which we touch and we are going to, to dive uh, in more details uh, in the next presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them whenever you want. Uh, can yeah, we can make it interactive. You yeah. can interrupt people during presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Also online, you can unmute whenever you want. Any questions for Pierre? Okay, no need for question now. We can, we can just. Uh... I don't have a real question, but I'm wondering um, during this interaction and creation, and of course also interaction with the surrounding human world, um, what's happening in the brain of the child? I mean, child, because of course this interaction won't be the same in each culture. Um, so, um, can we envision that in fact? permanent structure um, put in place during this crucial moment of the brain development yes. that will make, uh, um, in a sense, the brain of the children from each culture yes. and different in the, yes. in the way in which they deal with this task. Yes. So this is really an idea we are exploring. And so the, the basic idea is, is to explore uh, well, that is the idea that by, through cultural interaction, they will acquire some form of software for thinking that will implement a number of functionalities that are uh, very powerful, and yet were not in their biology at the beginning. Uh, so like, like I'm, I'm purposefully use, using the software term because maybe a simple analogy is if you take a computer, you have the hardware and you have the software, and you can have two computers that have exactly the same hardware, but one, it has very poor software on it, and you won't be able to do a lot of things with it. And another one is running very sophisticated software, and you're going to, 
to, to have, for example, abstract programming languages, which is going to allow you to do mathematics and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But exactly on the same hardware, and the difference is that there is uh, some kind of cultural input of humans that, that, that was used to, to program the software. And, and uh, maybe this is a bit simplistic, but, but maybe not so much simplistic that maybe culture in the human brain is doing something similar. And, and really like uh, through culture, that, and, and this is what we are really beginning to explore in, in, in those computational models with a neural network by having certain interaction with the social environment and language, the, neuro, the artificial neural networks can acquire internal uh, prop, properties that enable it to do some computation that were just not possible uh, like uh, at the beginning in, in a way. But, but at the same time, we have indication from um, um, neuroscience that uh, the hardware is also affected by this uh, um, sort of initial training, curiosity, et cetera, and yes. in, in, in some way, yes. so that in fact there is a matter of software and hardware that- Yeah, yeah. so th this is where in the limit of the metaphor I was mentioning, because here in the, in the computer metaphor, there is a, a clean separation between the notion of software and hardware. In a biological organism, there is not this clear separation, because for example, you have neurogenesis uh, especially in early childhood, and uh, neurogenesis is partially driven by interaction with the environment, and, and, and thus it's going to, to get into a certain configuration that is a physical configuration of neurons, but that is the result of interacting with the environment. So from a logical point of view, maybe what you could say is the hardware is the initial uh, uh, kit from the uh, from the initial cell of the organism, and as it is growing, then indeed, uh, they, they, I mean, uh, we, we could rather view, view a large part of the brain growth as a, a form of software, even if it is physically implemented. Okay, yeah, but I mean, in the end, uh, I mean, many studies show, show that it is rather a dialogue or a continuous dialogue between the the hardware and the software, and the hardware is um, influenced by this interaction. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, of course, perhaps not at this very, very early stage, but when we come to teaching, for example, sort of organized, structured, institutional teaching, yes. you are already in a, or even in teaching mathematics or counting or whatever, there is, um, the, the hardware is, in, um, is involved. Yes, 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 yes. The, the difficulty, and so here I kind of, I take the, the, the point, is that yeah, um, I think the software hardware uh, metaphor is useful uh, from a very high level point of view, but now if you look in the details, I, I think it's not any more relevant for biology, because uh, again, uh, the, any learning is, is a physical change of the brain. Uh, and, and then you come, in a sense, what you present is uh, overlapping with our yes. interest in the sense that then you come to the question of the heritability yes. of some of these traits that are hardware within the life of the individual, but for some reason, I mean, natural selection, and we don't really know how yes. natural selection acts at that yes, yes. age, some of them become inheritable. Yes. So that the overlap yeah. with us. You want to use my computer? Uh, uh, if you want to take yes. notes, I would like. Uh, to. I can do. I, I, I can bring you a pen and a paper. No, no, no. But so I, 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 I use my memory for your presentation, yes, and then I take <laughs> notes for the other. <laughs> Perhaps you want us to take any notes. <laughs> uh, okay.
Quand on n'aura pas ta présentation, il faudra que tu te connectes au lien que j'ai envoyé par mail. Daniel aussi d'ailleurs. Enfin, c'est juste pour la diffuser en ligne à ceux qui sont. So when the uh, um, Dr. Colin me said that it is a great pleasure and an honor to be with you today, and uh, I thank the both for inviting us and to what we work with us. I was in the field for three weeks in Africa, so don't uh, complain if my perhaps uh, presentation is less structured than you, you can imagine, but I try at the same time to point to some, uh, how would I think that put together the people that are working with me, and also some point of interest on which we are working, and I feel there may be interaction in the future if we dig up, um, and we will certainly find things that are interesting for both. So I don't expect in 20 minutes that I'm explaining you everything about the cultural evolution for the last 300,000 years, uh, but uh, um, you let me say, uh, uh, in our field or related field, there was the temptation to explain um, uh, cultural evolution by prime mover. So like uh, unique cause that would explain a fundamental change in culture during the last 300 years. And they make here, a list of these uh, uh, causes. This is something that um, uh, answers, in fact, the need. Once I ask a famous anthropo anthropologist, "Are you become famous in your life? And he replied, uh, you publish an idea, uh, doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, you keep saying the same in your life and you will become famous. Mm -hmm. So that if you find a, a potential prime mover like speciation, emotion, symbolic reasoning, or hierarchical mental construction, and you keep saying the same, you would become famous, but a single cause does not explain, and this is the main point in what I'm saying to present here. We are not interested in prime causes, but we are interested in mechanism, and I think this is maybe the common ground on which we can build. Mechanism being very often uh, the result of the interaction of many causes producing processes. So we are against the idea that everything has been produced by a single cause or a single event. Right. The other thing that can put us together is the idea that one, I mean, the final uh, outcome of one of these uh, um, uh, large processes is the construction of the human niche, which is the one we are um, living in. So the main question is how we have created the human niche, including, uh, of course, elaboration of language, complex technology, but also uh, uh, genetic inheritance and the dialogue between culture and gene. Uh, I, I make uh, some simple cases of uh, um, unique causes to uh, determine this process that now become less and less, less accepted. For example, biological evolution. There are still people out there that think that our, the speciation event that they produce ourselves in Africa, perhaps 200,000 years ago, uh, would determine, would grant to the new species a new cognition. So that's why we were able to develop what we call cultural evolution, just because as the result of a unique biological event that allowed the new species uh, to create innovation and eventually to come out of Africa and replace the uh, previous I mean, um, um, existing um, uh, human population like Neanderthal and so on. And we know now that this is not true. So all the last work show that uh, the, this process, from an anatomical point of view, is a very long one. And they started from the, the remains that we were citing, uh, citing discussing during our lunch, Jebel Erud. In fact, we have a, a very gradual accretion of an anatom of anatomical character that leads the population in Africa to become more than 100,000 years ago. So it's a very long process in, with uh, some modern character appearing in different regions of Africa. So this is a, um, a single biological change uh, does not explain this long process, and we do not find the palaeontologists do not find a clear divide with the human remains saying 200,000 years here we have the first modern human before they were not modern. Also, uh, genetic evidence contradicts these uh, hypotheses of different species. We know that we have exchanged gene with gene Neanderthal, Neanderthal exchanged with the Denisovan, Denisovan is exchange in with modern humans, and some human population around the world have 8% uh, of their gene inherited from Denisovan. So this is an indication that what has been 
seen very often as different pieces may be conceived of different population with diff different phenotypic character within a very large species. And archaeologically, uh, we see the same. There is no a uh, revolution in, uh, in the emergence of novel traits uh, like personal ornament, bone tools, beads, uh, symbolic behavior. But we have a very, very, very um, uh, delayed appearance of these traits. The first being the emergence, the, the first use of ochre, the first use of color that occurred in Africa between 300,000 and 400,000 years ago. Now we know that the earliest personal ornaments are around 140,000, 120,000, bone tools, 120,000, and uh, uh, abstract engraving between 100,000 and 70,000, and figurative uh, depiction um, around 40,000. So we know. Uh, and this is the idea of the last paper that has come out, that uh, there is an evolution in structural population in Africa. There is not just a single event producing a new species. And in the recent synthesis, it has been clear that the idea of a single speciation uh, has been abandoned in the multi-regional um, origin of the human within the African continent. This is just what I say, say, okay, we do not trust the idea that there is a single prime mover corresponding to biological evolution. But the same apply to climate change. Very often climate change has been presented as the prime mover of changes in biology, but also in human culture. And it's quite known, the hypothesis put forward by Richardson, Boyd, and Bessiger, in which they say uh, long-term climate a change has triggered cumulative culture, and the argument is we see uh, the last five million years both a, a, a degradation in climate that also corresponds with uh, the um, change, short change, I mean, short, the 100,000 years and sometimes less, um, in the, particular in the last million years, the last 500,000 years, and they would have. Uh, push the humans to uh, create cumulative culture because they were not able to, to cope with this uh, quick change with organic evolution. Uh, but this is a very general argument that in fact work like a single prime mover. We know that things are not so easy. Uh, we, we move around 500,000 uh, no, 500, years ago to a new climatic phases um, in fact, is not so. I mean, is, is, is well explained by the uh, astronomic uh, um, uh, astronomic hypothesis of the climate change, but there are different uh, uh, parameters um, that are not perfectly overlapped. So, by combining electric, oh, pardon, sorry, eccentricity, uh, obliquity, and precession, you can have different uh, interglacial and glacial of different lengths. So the question becomes how, after in the detail, things have changed. So how this climate change, not a general um, change at 500,000, but how each uh, interglacial and glacial period has uh, produced a change in, in human culture. And it's even more complicated because we now know that um, on top of this uh, um, orbit of scale variability, we have very small climatic change um, like all the um, Irish event um, and uh, the Dutch geological climatic event that create a, a milla millennium um, um, change of climate over Europe and uh, with different uh, impact on another region of the planet. So the population has faced a uh, change in, in climate that are comparable to the one that we are living now in the past. And, and of course, this has also may have also impacted the uh, cultural evolution. So to work on this, uh, to give an example of how we have dealt with that, we have uh, uh, conceived a, a scenario, a model, in which we uh, uh, think that human population has faced the, the climate change by enlarging or contracting their niche. Um, so each kind of change may have led to a uh, <coughs> extinction of population, or in some cases to an expansion of their niche, to the maintenance of the same niche or a contraction. And this is something that we have explored by, by using uh, ecoculture niche modeling, which is uh, the application of algorithm um, coming from ecology, uh, in which you can, using a number of uh, 
GIS raster layer predict the location of the um, calcium niche. So you use uh, um, climate modeling, but it's the same type of climate modeling that we use now to predict future climate, but we use it to predict past climate, and we use the uh, location uh, of uh, the archaeological site dated to one period to create a niche for uh, a past population. And we can see how this niche react to a following climate change. Uh, for example, we have used um, these to explore the Neanderthal extinction um, and show that uh, if we create a, a culture niche for uh, the Neanderthal in a uh, cold phase, which is the average stage, uh, the uh, average stage four, and we predict the niche on the following inter interstadia, which means if a warmer phase, the Neanderthal would have in this, in this following period occupied even a larger area of Europe, while in fact they are, they are, they are able to move to, okay, they are in fact the niche has contracted. And this occurs in parallel with an, with an uh, expansion of the modern human niche. So we in fact explain that climate change were not playing a role in the extinction of Neanderthal and that we have to evoke the arrival of modern human to uh, explain that the process. Uh, we have also worked on it on a, a subsequent uh, period of the upper paralytic and show that in the, in the culture of the first modern human called Orignatia, we have an increase in their niche corresponding to a cold period. So apparently uh, a technical, technological and symbolic innovation in this period make that in spite of this phase being uh, uh, colder, the modern human were able to colonize larger European territories. Um, so uh, we have also used that to uh, predict the niche and compare the niche of modern human in Southern Africa between two cultures, the Steel Bay and the Oysons Port, and show using the two different algorithms that uh, we assist to a, an expansion around uh, between uh, starting from 64,000 in spite of this being, being a period of higher aridity, we see uh, a first adaptation which is coastal, and further on an expansion uh, toward the interior of the following culture. Uh, we also apply that to linguistic, uh, uh, what we call the eco linguistic niche modeling to try to test the hypothesis that has been put forward several times that there is a link between linguistic diversity and the ecological risk. And we do that on New Guinea, which is an area, I mean, as you know, which will be the higher uh, linguistic variability on, in the world. Uh, so the, this shows that, in fact, uh, this is partially true, so that, in fact, uh, there is a link between ecological risk uh, and uh, uh, linguistic variability. But in the case of New Guinea, there is also historical events. So the arrival, in fact, the new population that is in part determined the linguistic geography. Um, um, so the main idea is that uh, the cultural traits that we see emerging during uh, cultural evolution in, during the last uh, 300,000 years, but in fact this graph arrived at 800,000 years, uh, cannot be explained as uh, uh, the result of a single uh, event or a single speciation event. Here in this graph you see uh, uh, different cultural traits related to symbol, symbolic behavior, technology, and subsistence strategies. Okay, and, and so this goes to 800,000. So as you can see, there is no uh, one uh, precise tipping point that these things emerge. Uh, so this cultural innovation emerge different times in different places. Some of these uh, occur and emerge outside Africa before the spread of anatomically modern human out of Africa, and our, so, so this means that uh, we cannot just rely on a biological change to uh, explain why and how the different cultural tree emerge, but they must be uh, the uh, result of different regional trajectories in the evolution of different populations. And then we are proposing a couple of papers that three, three causes or three, uh, say three elements may play a role in this interaction. We call the, those the cultural exaptation, which is the, let's say, the cultural uh, uh, counterpart of the biological exaptation. So, a cultural exaptation in the cases in which you use innovation, use cultural traits to produce new innovation with a new function. 
uh, we also give a lot of importance to teaching, to the way in which people transmit, and that is, I say, in, in, the, in the way is one topic that overlap with your, with your own interest. How teaching um, uh, in different cultural in, environment can transmit the new cultural trait, because this new cultural trait need to be accepted by the new generation, and um, and what we call cultural neural reuse, which is uh, basically the plasticity of our brain and the possibility of our plasticity to create hardware changes in the brain during the life of the individual, if the individual are submitted to a, uh, uh, a compulsory training. Uh, we've also tried in another paper to model this. So, so I see, that in fact, what I'm presenting here is in a sense overlap some up with some of the papers that we have presented with the different, that we, we have tried to create a model in different, uh, so we call it spatial dimension, temporal dimension, and social dimension, uh, that a model that we could also apply to uh, uh, prehistoric cultural traits, and eventually not just to human, but also to primates, to try and see how um, cultural traits are transmitted. i give you an example. For example, in the case of, so we, we, we create a, uh, a number of uh, elements, the practitioner, the learner, the action, the goal, and the transmission. And in the case, for example, the transmission, we call it distant observation, is one first strategy to learn that we see very often in, uh, in primates. Disconnected proximal observation, conscious proximal observation, proximal observation with practitioner intentionality, which means that, in fact, you are not teaching to somebody, but uh, there is an intention of the person to show what he's doing, the person of the chimp, and more and more complex up to the explanation in absence of, of action. We may, so this is what just the special dimension, there are the other two dimensions, I'm not going into it. Uh, so this is, it, it could be used, uh, if we look at each of cultural traits emerging during the last uh, 800,000 years, we can ask uh, this technology in napping, this production of uh, beads, what are the different type of uh, uh, dimension and, and characteristics that we need to be transmitted? So, and this is something that, on which we are working right now. Something we are also interested in is the culturalization of the human body, which is also, we, is, is, is we, we, we see more and more, is a, is, is a long process. Uh, up to 20, uh, 20 years ago, it was believed that the first bead that the culturalization happened 40,000 years ago when modern humans arrived in Europe. Now we know it's a very long process, starting with the use of pigment 300,000 years ago. And after we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, beads, uh, the first bead, the earliest are 140,000 in North Africa and 80, 90,000 in South Africa. And then uh, these are simple beads, in each side, you only find one type of shell uses bead. And then we move to the face with the upper paleolithic, which is much more complex. You, you see, this is a variation in which you have the side, the archaeological side and the type. And we see that, in fact, there is a cline uh, with some side, the closest side uses simple, some type, and sometimes shared with other sites, a bit like as with gene. So we have a cultural geography that is uh, depicted by, by, by personal ornament. And Daniel will talk more about that. So the, the culturalization of the human body can be seen at different stages during the cultural evolution, starting with just the simple use up to very complex the use of, of personal ornament. Of course, we are also, I mean, by, because of my ESC synergy, we are interested also of a similar evolution, but concerning the way in which people quantify precisely. We share with many animal species the capacity to, what's called number sense, the uh, distinguish between quantities. But humans are the only one who are able to count and, and, uh, in a very precise way, and this is, uh, need to be touched uh, culturally. Uh, we children can go up to two or three, but we, for, for, for becoming experts, in counting and mathematics, you need the cultural train. So how this, this happened in human history? How um, different modalities, which I mean counting with finger, or making notches on bone, uh, creating symbolic system for counting, or saying one, two, three, how these different modalities interact with each other to arrive at the situation that is the present situation. This is something 
also in which we are in, in, interested. And I presented a, in the paper a preliminary step scenario of for, for the production at the very end of number simple, starting from intentional cut marks. So we look, we have studied a number of bones, and this is a, is a way, is a possible scenario that we like to test during the uh, ESTC energy. Um, I, I, I think I hope I'm not to explode the, the timing. Okay. But, um, Take your time, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> but something also we are interested a lot because it is a, it's a, a part of the uh, culture evolution is the way in which we, we deal with the, with the, with that. And uh, here also we see as with uh, numbers, as with uh, the culturalization of the human body, um, that things have changed a lot in the last uh, uh, 20 years. 20 years ago, the, the issue was when did burial, primary burial, primary burial are for anthropologists, those in which you make a, a, a grave, you make a pit and you put the body and you cover the body with the sediment. Otherwise, you would call it in a different way. So the main question were, were Neanderthal producing burial when the first burial occurred? And we realized, in fact, that things are much more complicated. So why they are complicated? Because uh, we see more and more paper sorry, coming out uh, with chimpanzee mortuary practices. So the chimpanzee uh, have a, um, a concern for the body, which means that probably our common ancestors also were interested in this moment of death. And we may envision, we have had in, in, before primary burial, in cases like uh, Tima de los Huesos, we have a place in which the body were put. We have many, many people put in, in, a, in a hole at the, at the bottom of a, of a cave. Uh, there are now new sites like uh, uh, Raising Star in Africa, and all this push some colleagues to consider that we, we do not have just to consider uh, burial practices in terms of present assets or burial, but in a much more complex way. We have to create a, a typology of different, different practices from duration, which is just you know, the fact that you are taking the body and put it in a place, or the morbidity, up to uh, the detachment commemoration. So we have to, to, to try to use this typology to see how things have changed uh, and how these different traits emerge, when they emerge, whether they emerge at the same time during this cultural evolution. Uh, and up to a very complex situation, for example, this is what a, a PhD student of ours is working, which is the first case, the first case in human history um, in, with degradation around 30,000 years ago when we have many, many burials in Europe and we see that if we, do, we look at the grave good, the objects that have been put in the burial, you can identify a geography uh, of people wearing different things. And the, so this is for the principal coordinate in which you see two groups of burial from Eastern Europe, uh, Italy and Southern Europe, and the Atlantic coast, which are quite, uh, so how, how we, we move from a situation in which you just uh, curate or explore the body among chimpanzee up to the moment in which uh, 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 the burial are reflecting the cultural geography of people. Certainly, these entail a different step. And another thing we have been interested in is how this can correlate with the emergence of social inequality. For example, we study a number of uh, burials. And this one, Sam uh, Jamel Arrivière, which is not very far from Bordeaux, in which we have shown, sorry, okay, we have shown that this uh, lady had been buried with many, many red deer canines. You know that the red deer have uh, two canines, which are not used by the animal, and in a situation in which there was no red deer in the landscape. So in the landscape, these people were eating uh, antelope, saiga, uh, reindeer, horse, bison. So these objects have been uh, uh, exchanged with people uh, living in the Basque Country, in the Atlantic Coast, where there was still. So these, these are great goods, which are exotic great goods. They may indicate that uh, um, since the other burial that you have in this region at the same moment do not have exotic uh, great goods, that this person had 15,000 years ago already a social status that would make the lady different from other people of the group. 
So this is also something that we are interested in. How uh, burial can indicate uh, uh, in the grave wood associated with burial is able to uh, indicate this development. So just to uh, many of these of what I said so far um, are the questions that we are asking in the GPR uh, Human Past funded by the University of Bordeaux. So we have a number of work packages starting from the more, more biological question, what mechanism is affected genetic and phenotypic diversity in human and animal communities, up to how this symbolic system emerged and how did affect the societal organization. So, and, and of course, uh, in the GPR human path, we don't only have only funded projects, but we also have projects that could be funded um, as a result of interaction between the member of the GPR, but also with uh, you know, colleagues from other institutions, we may, in, in, from the point of view of funding, be a way also to create this type of interaction. I think I perhaps talked too much. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, that's right. Um, of course, question if you have a question. Um, when you see culture inheritance, is it always like so, sorry, sorry, what did you say? Uh, when you observe inheritance of culture, mm -hmm. do you see that it happens like through the environment and the body, or did you say you also see happening periodically like the indigenous disease? Did you see? Oh, yeah. If you have seen a uh, cultural inheritance, mm -hmm. like you see some biological inheritance. Mm -hmm. Like culture is the Well, um, culture. Uh, I mean, many. I would say many uh, agree on the idea that there is a that there is a dialogue between uh, biology and culture. So it's clear that uh, cultural traits are inherited. Biological traits. The difference is that cultural trait you can also learn it from somebody. Uh, you have no. Genetic contact, I mean, genetic contact with. So it, it's the whole story of the means and genes. So, you, cultural trait can be, it's like, a bit like language. You know, you can uh, learn a language, but it does not uh, affect uh, at all your genome in case you don't have a genetic exchange with the person from which you. I mean, you have, of course, much more chances to have genetic exchange. I mean, we can open that you may have more chances to have a genetic exchange with somebody you are still talking to. But this is not necessarily the case. So it's the it's the it's the big difference between cultural traits and cultural trait can also disappear. Uh, that people can remain, and uh, is uh, probably very optimistic to think that cultural traits and cultural evolution necessarily go um, in, in an increasing mode. People can <coughs> disappear, but also cultural trade can disappear, um, and there is not necessarily a, a intensification and uh, complexity. So we can, in some cases, perhaps because of climate change, lose uh, cultural complexity. Uh, perhaps this is maybe, I mean, there are not 22 other prime movers, but you know, population size has been often considered one of the prime movers that would condition cultural evolution, for example. So, um, uh, is, um, let's say, in a sense, it makes the, the research more interesting because if we have cultural trait and genetic trait transmitted in the same way, it would be too boring. Uh, but does not make these things uh, more uh, easy. So, in this, in this scientific universe, do, do, uh, so. Are there some kind of uh, approximate quantifications of the rate of change of uh, culture uh, okay. the, the, in different contexts? This is a very interesting question. Um, I mean, the, the idea that uh, um, the rate of change change uh, dramatically. Um, I would say um, starts changing at around 300,000. In my view, okay. before we have uh, basically 95% um, of the archaeological remains are bifaces, uh, or uh, the leftover of bifaces plus some tools that very often come from bifaces. 
And this is something that started in Africa 1,600,000 years ago, but spread in Europe much later. And in Europe, as in Africa, you have also people who do not produce biphases. Uh, and there is a variety of biphases, different ways of producing them, but basically they are producing the same tool. So how it can happen that people for one million years produce biphases, clearly it does not indicate a very uh, strong rate of change. Uh, after 300,000, uh, uh, biphases are gradually abandoned in Africa, although there are some more recent sites where you found biphases. Um, so you start the flake, flake industry uh, with different napping technology, uh, predetermination of the tools, uh, uh, and more or less the same process is occurring in Europe. And in Europe, uh, from 300,000 on, we see uh, changes. Changes that we, unfortunately, we can only perceive uh, through deletics, because maybe other domain in which there was changes, but they have not arrived to us. Um, uh, in Europe, um, um, we see uh, from, I would say, 44,000 years ago, um, a high rate of change in the cultural, um, in the cultural uh, characters, um, which are not only seen in the lithics, but also in other elements, uh, production of home tools, uh, uh, personal ornament, burial, for example, in the first uh, just to uh, talk about the burial. In the early nation, there is no one single burial. In the gravation, there are many, many burials. In the falling culture, there is no burial again. So we have, uh, not because people were not uh, treated, the body were not treated, but probably because they are dramatic. And even in the Neanderthal world, we have region in which we have burial, in the region in which, for example, we find human remains in Aina then, because perhaps the, the body was exposed, so the Aina were taking the body and taking part of the body in the then. So they are probably very different. Uh, already in the Neanderthal world in Europe, we have regionalization and changes. Um, but they clearly changes in, in the way in which it's. How we can explain that? I would say, if one has a clear demonstrative answer to explain why uh, there is a, a, gradual, a gradual increase in the rate of change, that would be fantastic. You have at least an idea of what are the main factors that could influence this? Uh, yeah. Well, there are probably many factors. Um, I would say one, uh, although now there are a couple of papers that uh, fight against population size, certainly population size is, is a, can be a key factor in the, in the spread of innovation. So in all, there are a number of modeling modeling paper that show that if you are, um, if your population size is relatively low and your rate of, uh, um, and also connection between groups are relatively low, it can be broken, for example, by climate change, environmental change, you may have uh, innovation, <coughs> you may have inventions that never become innovation. So inventions that have been created by somebody, but they won't become innovation because they won't ac be accepted by a group. Um, and the more you are relying on uh, very uh, structured, by sure, behavior, the less you would be prone to accept a complex innovation if this can create uh, a challenge to the group. So there is a, certainly an adherence to um, cultural tradition because they, they, you know that they are relatively simple, but they are effective, and uh, by adopting them, uh, you will survive while uh, a group of hunter-gatherers. Uh, at some stage, one guy said, well, we, only, we always went left, so today we go right, and you disappear in a week. So you, something that is well established will be followed. I mean, when I was working with the people in, from the Calari, we took a few elders, we stayed with them in 10 days in a museum, so they were showing us their material culture and so on. We, we ask, no, if you see somebody doing something different, something new, how you would react to that? And people will say, we will try their way, but we will come back to our own way. So that's, perhaps uh, this mechanism must be multiplied by 100 for people living, you know, five, six hundred thousand years ago. Of course, it's also biology, because these people were not like us in terms of um, 
uh, brain volume and as we know brain volume is, is, is a very rough way of uh, different brain volume and different connectivity. So in fact now no nobody can really predict from the brain volume and brain morphology what are the, the cognition of a, a past hominin. Even if some people try to send it, but uh, could we say that there are at, at least two mechanisms that could uh, influence cultural innovation uh, across groups? One which will be a bit like, uh, let's say, cooperative in a sense, for example, that different groups discover uh, different, uh, well, develop different cultural traits, mm -hmm. and when they, when they meet, uh, they can merge them together to create new cultural uh, mm -hmm. items, for example. And maybe another one which is which should be like a bit more competitive, I think it's a, it has a name called like kismogenesis or something like this, where instead two groups are in a competition, in some sort of a cultural competition, let's say, and each group develops a cultural traits by opposition to other groups. Do you think these two mechanisms uh, mm -hmm. can, can play together and do you think there are other mechanisms uh, in terms of how groups interact that can influence cultural innovation? Okay, well, uh, I would say the first mechanism probably is, uh, that we may envision, is the uh, invention occurring within a group. So the first question that one must ask is, uh, okay, somebody within a group, um, I think probably as a form of exaptation, uh, say something is existing, but from something that exists, that somebody creates something. Like, for example, uh, you, know, you are able to nap, discover that by putting your raw material in the fire in some condition, covering with sand, etc., your raw material improves its quality, so you can better now. Okay. So in fact, this is a typical case of the cultural adaptation. Okay. But then the following question, even before going to the neighboring group is, is your um, proposition of adaptation, this will be accepted by your group or not? So, in this case, the ingredient for that to transform the invention in innovation is that your group accepts to, uh, to transmit this innovation to new generation. So, uh, and this entails that, uh, so the question is, how long does it take to learn your technique? Um, are the, for the culture of the group, prone to spending time to teach this new technique. So how open is to um, the group to that change? Uh, so I think that this is a, is a, is a, is a crucial moment. That, and I think that many, many uh, you know, being invention have not become innovation because uh, people, the group, the way in which, uh, the way in which group um, uh, transmits uh, cultural traits is not open or is not uh, um, the side is too demanding and too costly to transmit this new culture. Um, that's why uh, and we put teaching. Um, teaching is, is, is probably the reason for this to not become innovation is that people do not accept it. So there are a number of uh, variables that play a role there in this crucial moment of acceptance. And then, okay, and then it comes the moment in which, you know, by, by cultural, exchange, people see what you are sort of doing, etc. And for that in case, uh, they say there are two known mechanisms, you know, imitation and imitation. So you can, the imitation entails that you really have to know all the steps to reach the goal. While emulation, you can do it uh, in your own way, and perhaps you will reach a goal that will not necessarily be what you would achieve uh, by imitation. Imitation and they that uh, you, that the other that you are meeting, um, really have access to all the steps of the process. You now, because you can see somebody with an arrow and the bow, but you say, okay, I will try to make an arrow and the bow, but you know, you just do it myself. But you don't know what is the tree, how you have to work the trees, how you have to make the glue for the point, how you make the bow, and etc. In fact. You can make a very shitty bow, and you realize that you use the spear, you are more effective. So, bow and, and, and arrow technique is a typical technology in which you really have to do it by 
by imitation. If you do it by emulation, you will have to make a lot of try before, try before reaching this point. Um, and some another mechanism that one has to take on in, in, to account is just uh, natural selection. You can create a, a technique that perhaps within your group will increase your chances to reproduce, which also is, uh, is also uh, okay. I think we'll explore a possibility between <laughs> <laughs> you and me. Uh, uh, so would you say that also another factor that plays a role here is this uh, tendency of humans to sometimes even over imitate so when you actually even though it appears to work worse you actually do it just because you know okay so I don't know maybe you have um, you have somebody who is highly ranked in your society and he uses a spear and you see that a bow is more efficient but you have a tendency even to like use a spear because you know that, that, that's very true. I mean, clearly, uh, um, in a group in which everybody is doing is a spear, you arrive with a boy, and people will think you are mad. Because, in fact, you have, if you have to, to participate to a collective hunting and everybody has a, has a spear, who is this guy coming here with a boy? They, they don't. In fact, the boy is something which is very effective in a, in a um, for, forest environment, but is not very effective in an open air environment unless you have a horse. I mean, but going to use that. Um, so, no, I, I perfectly agree. I mean, um, the, the, the other limitation provides to human an advantage as a disadvantage. But the advantage is that you buy a computer and you use it, and, and you don't open the computer, so you're always working inside, you just trust the people who send you the computer. But, uh, you know, all the, but in fact, you could make, be very exact, I mean, and, uh, all the uh, work done by, you know, uh, uh, white and, a show with one with limitation in between children and chimps, the chimps can do it much quicker because they do not easily over imitate. But apparently, this idea of over imitating in the long run has helped humans. Uh, uh, say you just do it the way. But this also has a lot to do with teaching. So we, have, we have to live in a society that accepts to, to transmit all the elements that will push somebody to do to over imitate because this way you will fit you will fit the, your role, you will do. Um, so it's a lot to do with cooperation, that's also with the teaching, and, which is also with constraint, in a sense is limiting your creativity. Yeah, but could it also be seen as like um, increasing robustness in your culture? Like the example which you gave, so somebody comes with a bow, and it seems like it works better, but actually your culture is more in like tight spaces, so Actually, in the long term, it turns out that it's actually better for your culture to use the spear, even though it doesn't seem like this at first. So, in a sense, even though people are over imitating, it's kind of giving a more, um, it's adding robustness to a culture, giving like, okay, we are sticking to our own ways, we are not so much prone to change, which it might be, mean that we will develop slower, but it also might mean that we will be harder to. Yeah, uh, but I mean, there was a, a, a famous paper in science in which they make the difference between loose society and tight society. So there are people that the loose society are those that are, are more prone to invention, to let uh, the children to you know uh, cry or you know, and the, the tight society are the one that they explain very quickly to the children. You have to don't do that. So that perhaps is the is a way with many societies staying in between. The, the paper was suggesting that past, past the cultural event and the, the, the ecological setting may have played a role in these different attitudes toward innovation. So societies that uh, live in, in, in environments which are uh, highly constrained with high ecological risk, uh, or perhaps that have undergone uh, no, very difficult history, uh, they may be uh, less prone to uh, creativity. Right. Um, perhaps this is the case. I, um, I think I took too much time. Yeah, I, I had the last question. I was like uh, the modeling of niches because you have some, like you, you showed us in some of your work, you use some uh, modeling of niches, niches and especially how they change over time, like for example with some hypothesis. And I'm wondering, like, what type of uh, input to give to the model? Like, for example, uh, 
as you said, that you have like climate, uh, climate mm -hmm. data that you can input, but do you also take into account like animal future thing? Because, for example, humans can adapt to some variation of the environment and change its environment to survive better in the next generation. Then is it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, in fact, there is a question with many questions. Uh, okay. The question, um, the first question is how. Uh, we can model this uh, evolution of cultural traits, for example, say, for example, for personal ornament, the culturalization of, of the body. Uh, I don't, um, as an archaeologist, my, at present, my only means is to um, observe what is coming out in the archaeological record. And for example, in the paper that um, uh, scientific report consider is out of the scope of the paper and they have to publish somewhere else. I use new evidence to try and create a step-by-step -step process, starting with Walker, that entails 12 different steps. Perhaps this was the reason for rejecting the paper. Uh, to, uh, to, to the present situation, in, in the way in which you culturalize your body. Uh, but this only comes from the archaeological observation after everything. But I would be very welcome to interact with you if you create a sort of long-term um, um, agent-based model in which we try to say how you move, what are the advantages that uh, um, entails moving from a situation in which you just cover your body with ochre and up to a situation in which, uh, in fact, needs are produced by, uh, by factories. So you have a total reproduction, so you can try to culturalize your body as much as you want. Because uh, but there are many intermediate steps, some of which I've mentioned in the so that's, I would be delighted to try and, and model that. What are the advantages of every complex? Um, um, uh, in some cases, we have more tools, like in the interactions where we use uh, uh, the algorithm to try and see how a niche in a moment may evolve in a niche, may disappear, may expand, may contract, and et cetera. And these are like, uh, how is it done? Like uh, like what are the parameters that you give it to the model? What are yeah, in this case, well, the element that we are giving to the, to the which is not really a model, in fact, is is the application of an algorithm to uh, uh, existing data. So basically, you give the geographic coordinate of the archaeological site belonging to a given culture dated to the same period. Uh, you have. Uh, um, 30, 40 uh, uh, GIS raster level, which in the, you know, the mean precipitation of the year, uh, the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, the orography, etc. cetera. Um, and then the algorithm, what it tried to do is to try to identify what these po the different points in the landscape have in common. So they use the different layer as a variable to create a, a niche in a, in a climatic envelope which is a multi, in fact, is a, is a, uh, is a p in principal component analysis in which all these different factors identify what is the volume of the niche. And that they project this volume on, on a map. So in a sense, it's not a model because we're not modeling something. We're just mm. trying to find out what is the, and then you can try to make either a projection, either a statistical analysis to see whether the same people living in the same place in the falling climatic phase, okay, I mean, to create, and you also, no, you, create, you need, of course, to create the paleoclimatic model a number of uh, inputs, for example, no. ice sheet, uh, CO2 concentration, and other elements that you know happen in the, the, the given time. These are, this would be the input of. Uh, Oh, sorry, for the night. <laughs> Can you talk a question? Just time out. Thank you for the meeting. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. 
people. Can you see the slides that are mine? It's a marker. Yes. Look at the camera, you can do this. Introductions from uh, Pierre Ivan Francesco. Uh, I'm going to uh, present a project uh, we are, uh, we are uh, which is running now uh, in the power team, which is called Origins for grounding artificial intelligence in the origins of human uh, behavior. And this is a project which is funded by uh, a fund from INRIA, which is called Exploratory Action, which allows to fund projects that are uh, exploratory, I think. And this is um, what allows us to recruit uh, Lenin Initiative for the, the last two years on this project. And so Lenin has highly contributed to most of the things I will, uh, I will show today. So in this project, we are uh, interested in what, we, in what we call open-ended skill acquisition, which is this uh, tendency of uh, humans to continuously invent new problems and uh, to acquire new skills in order to, to solve them in an open-ended way. And uh, most, uh, well, a large majority of works are interested in open ended skill acquisition, both in cognitive science and also in artificial intelligence, uh, focus on how it is implemented in the brain or in uh, an artificial agent. And this, in this project, we try to extend uh, this to two uh, related, uh, but we think also important questions, which is how did it evolve uh, in the first place? Uh, especially given the fact that the, let's say, the evolutionary advantage of the skills illustrated here is not necessarily obvious. And uh, a first question we are interested in is how is it uh, sustained? Which is what are the mechanisms that, uh, that uh, maintain its open-ended aspect? The fact that it's continuously increasing in complexity, for example. And so uh, today I will, uh, well, I will mostly focus on the methodology we adopt in this project, and more generally, actually, in the Flowers uh, group, uh, where we start from insights uh, from humans, like human evolution, human development, and human ecology. And then uh, we try to uh, highlight some relationships with some computational principles in artificial intelligence. And this analysis then uh, allow us to uh, propose um, some common research framework of common research questions uh, that can be interesting or relevant for both fields, which then allow us to uh, implement some computer simulations. This is what we do as a computer scientists. Uh, and that in turn uh, allow us to propose new algorithms for artificial intelligence, to uh, refine or reframe our research questions and frameworks, and Sherry and the Cage uh, to propose, for example, new hypotheses or new experiments uh, related to uh, human evolution, development, or ecology. Uh, so I will um, just highlight a uh, few points of this methodology, starting from the relationships between uh, human e evolution, development, ecology on one side, and artificial intelligence, computational principles on the other side. Starting with uh, human evolution, where uh, a central hypothesis is that environmental complexity is a central driver of uh, behavioral diversity and generality. Uh, and this is in particular the case in theories uh, from human behavioral ecology, which is a field uh, that attempts to understand uh, what are the ecological conditions that could have uh, driven the evolutions of human as a particularly generalist species. 
And so in this field, uh, well, the spotlight, the spotlight is mostly, not, not only, but mostly uh, in the Rift Valley in East Africa, which is hypothesized uh, to have had very particular climate dynamics uh, a few million years ago, uh, at the time of early homos, uh, with alternations between uh, periods that are relatively well, quite dry with low resources, periods that are quite wet with higher resources, and in between uh, periods of uh, high chaotic uh, climate variability. Um, and uh, so, from what we understood as computer scientists, uh, earlier hypotheses uh, were proposing that uh, what mostly drove uh, human evolution was uh, global tendencies from uh, wet, wetter to drier climates, so like less and less resources and more and more difficulty, basically, driving uh, <coughs> the need for like, more advanced skills in the sense. And the more recent hypothesis actually focuses more on uh, this type of chaotic uh, periods, proposing that actually uh, most speciation and extinction events in human evolution occurred uh, during the period of higher variability. And uh, we believe that this actually mirrors some arguments in artificial intelligence, and in particular in uh, a field which is called uh, meta reinforcement learning. So I'm going to try to explain what uh, meta reinforcement learning is, and for this I first need to explain a bit what is reinforcement learning. So very quickly, in reinforcement learning, we consider an artificial agent that can interact with an environment through actions that can modify the state of this environment, and the agent, in return, will uh, observe the current state of the environment and receive a reward. And so the objective of reinforcement learning is to learn what we call an action policy, which is basically a function mapping the observed state of the environment to the actions in order to maximize uh, a cumulative reward over, over the long term. Uh, so here is a, a very classical example uh, in uh, the video game of Pac-Man, where here the agent um, is uh, this little Pac-Man here that originally just do random actions. Uh, and so this agent will have reward when it hits uh, this sum of cones that can be viewed as some sort of resources, let's say. And so over time, the agent learns to better and better maximize this reward, that is to better and better collect the, the cones, while avoiding uh, these ghosts, let's say predators, uh, that uh, can kill it if uh, they touch it. Okay, so this is basically the kind of, uh, of learning mechanisms that are, that are um, implemented in the most So in a sense, it can be viewed a bit like as a sort of developmental mechanism where an agent uh, learns how to uh, perform a task over his own lifetime. So then what we call meta reinforcement learning uh, is uh, relatively similar. We still consider an agent interacting with an environment, a reinforcement learning loop that maximizes rewards. Uh, but on top of this, uh, well, then we actually, we don't consider a single task in a single environment, but instead a distribution of diverse environments. And uh, we add on top of the, uh, let's say, developmental reinforcement learning loop, a meta-learning loop that operates at larger spatial temporal scales, and that uh, will fine-tune uh, the parameters of uh, this developmental loop, uh, just that uh, this performs well on the distribution of environments. Uh, so, in a sense, one can view uh, meta-learning as analogous to an evolutionary pro process that will tune the parameters of a developmental process and will operate at larger spatial temporal scales. So, here is a very recent example uh, where here there, there are like uh, two agents that interact in uh, this type of complex world and that are exposed to many, many different uh, games uh, with different reward structures. And so they are trained in a number of these environments, usually quite a high number, actually. These are automatically generated, so they can have quite a high number of them. And then what is evaluated in meta reinforcement learning, usually, is not uh, only the ability of the agent to maximize their reward, but more importantly, the ability to generalize what they have learned in previous environments to totally novel environments. Well, not totally novel, but environments that share some structural properties, but since they uh, skills that they have never encountered before. Um, and so, typically there is this kind of common uh, hypothesis between these two fields, where uh, in both cases, it is considered that environmental high viability is what drives the ability of agents 
uh, to acquire diverse, diverse and general uh, behaviors. So let's now move to uh, human development. Where well, here, the main hypothesis is that open-ended wheel acquisition, or ESA, uh, is driven by two uh, main mechanisms, uh, intrinsic motivation and sociocultural transmission. So intrinsic motivation uh, is a concept that has been introduced in the mid-20th century uh, in order to characterize uh, the behavior of uh, like young infants, like this one, uh, that do a lot of things without being uh, necessarily driven by uh, external motivations or external rewards. For example, this kid here uh, is not uh, hungry, he is not thirsty, uh, there is no caregiver interacting or telling what to do, but still he is doing a lot of uh, things, he is exploring his own body, he is exploring objects uh, in a quite structured way. He is even sometimes doing like, dangerous things, like for example, putting a finger in the, in the, in the plug. And, uh, and so, yeah, from an evolutionary point of view, it's not super clear uh, why you would do this, where I could just stay still and wait for caregivers to, uh, to, feed, uh, to feed her. Uh, but still, it is what it does. So, basically, uh, in traffic motivation and development of psychology, try to understand this type of uh, motivational behavior uh, that also Pierre is, Pierre is introduced uh, in the fall before. Uh, then, the second mechanism is social cultural transmission. Uh, and here again, a number of uh, developmental psychologists have uh, studied this question uh, in the, well, the last uh, few decades, let's say. Uh, so with the idea that uh, infants acquire uh, skills uh, not only by exploring, but also on, uh, on, on a big part by interacting uh, between themselves and with adults. Uh, and uh, as Thierry mentioned in his talk also that uh, these sociocultural interactions can be internalized uh, by the infants uh, that can then uh, recruit them as some sort of cognitive tools in order to, in order to acquire new cognitive uh, abilities. And so here again, uh, this mirror uh, many work in uh, artificial intelligence and in particular a uh, number of teams in the world have been uh, trying to model these mechanisms uh, in the last two decades at least, including our team uh, at Flowers, where we have proposed, uh, let's say, a family of algorithms that we call intrinsically motivated goal exploration, um, where uh, the main idea is, uh, if we start from the standard uh, with response learning framework that I have presented before, where uh, rewards are provided by the environment, in intrinsically motivated goal exploration, we, uh, we basically don't consider that rewards are provided by the environment, which anyway, makes little biological sense, but instead, uh, these algorithms consider agents that are able to generate their own intrinsic goals and rewards, and uh, to uh, pursue them and try to learn skills in order to achieve them. So this is a recent example uh, from the team. There are many others, but this is one. Oops, here. So where we, the agent is basically this type of uh, robotic arm, uh, that, in that is in an environment uh, with a table and some uh, color cubes on top of these tables. And this robot has no uh, pre-specified task to achieve, but instead uh, it will generate its own goals, for example, about like, uh, placing objects at different positions or stacking them together, uh, and will then uh, explore the sensory motor uh, interaction with the environment in order to learn how to achieve these uh, self-generated uh, goals. Then in terms of socio-cultural transmission, there have been also a number of, world, of works uh, that have been done uh, related to artificial intelligence, for example, in social robotics, uh, how uh, robots, for example, human human robots like this one, can acquire skills from their interaction with a human, uh, both sensory motor interaction or linguistic interaction. And uh, also, and much more recently, there have been a number of uh, cognitive works that are leveraging uh, recent advances in natural language processing and uh, that shows that uh, an artificial agent can be able to uh, learn uh, quite complex uh, skills in uh, video games such as, such as Minecraft, uh, that are like complex video games uh, where uh, basically a player can do a lot of different things without uh, any external goal. And these algorithms are interesting because they learn by directly watching uh, online content, uh, for example, YouTube videos or uh, blog posts or forums, 
that the gamer community is, uh, is generating. And so basically, they have to internalize the knowledge within this uh, online content in order to learn a relatively large variety of skills uh, in this complex video games. Uh, so this is very interesting, and we think it's pretty interesting uh, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, what, how machine can, uh, in, can internalize future. And so last insight uh, from uh, ecology, where here the main hypothesis is that agents uh, modify their own environment, and by doing so, they, mod they can modify their own fitness landscape. Uh, so this is, for example, the case uh, in co-adaptation between different species or between different groups, uh, which is modulated uh, by the game theoretic context uh, implied by the environment. It can be, for example, cooperative, competitive, or uh, mixed. And uh, also uh, in uh, niche construction theories, uh, which recognize that uh, inheritance is not only uh, mediated through the genes, but also through the environment, uh, in particular with the process of ecological inheritance, where uh, one generation modifies the environment that in which the, further, the, the next generation will then uh, live and learn. And so this effect of niche construction is particularly prominent in the human species, uh, in particular because uh, we are able to build quite complex tools uh, and uh, also to uh, cooperate in quite large groups uh, that allow us to uh, deeply modify the structure of our environment for the best and for the worst. So this also mimics some uh, works, well, maybe, it allows mirror some works in artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, the concept of uh, multi-agent autocurricula, which is typically the machine learning terms uh, for like arms race kind of uh, dynamics, uh, where, uh, well, and maybe just show an example here. This is a recent work which is uh, quite fun when you have uh, two teams of two agents that play a game of hide and seek. Uh, so it's basically a zero-sum game when one team wins, the other team loses. And so the blue are the hiders, they have to hide from the red that are the seekers. So at the beginning, they learn uh, relatively trivial strategies to hide and to seek. Uh, and in the environment, there are a number of items like these boxes or these firms. Uh, and so at some point, uh, in this particular example, uh, we will see that the, yes, the blue uh, team, the hiders, uh, discover that they can use the blocks in order to block uh, the door that protects them from the seekers. And so this creates a new challenge uh, for the seekers that cannot not, not find the, uh, the hiders anymore. And at some point, the seekers will discover that they can use this type of front, which is soon, in order typically to escalate, uh, to go above the wall and uh, find the seekers, which then in turn create a new challenge for the hiders uh, that will discover that they can bring the wrong in before, before locking the door, etc., etc. Uh, obviously, this uh, converges to some limit at some point, but still it's a good example, and one of the rare ones actually we, we have, I think, in, uh, in AI, about how uh, this kind of open-ended dynamic can be generated uh, through this type of complex game theoretic structures. Uh, then, more related to niche construction, uh, there is also this interesting work uh, from 2017 that I personally considered as one of the most interesting papers uh, in AI in the last five years. We are here, the agents are these little red dots, which is like a, a 2D view of a map that we see from above, and these uh, red agents uh, are what they reward when they collect these green resources. And these green resources have a particular uh, dynamics, which is that they can uh, regrow on the condition that uh, they are not isolated, that there are other resources around. So if a resource is isolated, at some point it will actually uh, uh, disappear. And, uh, and if they are surrounded by other resources, they will naturally regrow. And so agents in this environment will first learn how to uh, optimally collect these resources, uh, because this is what gives, provides them more reward. Uh, but at some point, they will actually uh, become too good at this, and they will uh, consume more, too many resources, <coughs> preventing them to regrow. And if we continue the training a bit further, we actually observe that the agent can converge to a more sustainable strategy, uh, where they no sense cooperate in order to uh, only eat resources in the spots where they are not, uh, where they are isolated, keeping some spots where the resources can regrow in order to uh, maintain the stock and be able to, in this way, to maximize their, their reward. 
Okay. Okay, so this is all for this uh, first part and uh, from this insight in these three fields uh, to the relationships uh, and artificial intelligence. And I'm now going to, um, to uh, well, uh, use this analysis in order to uh, present you a conceptual framework we have been developing with Eleni over the, the, the last two years, let's say, uh, and also to refine the research questions uh, that are presented above. Uh, so this framework is called Origins as well as the project. Uh, and so I recall here the three main takeaways from the, from the previous part. So in this framework, uh, we consider at first environmental complexity uh, in line with the first hypothesis, uh, which is uh, driven by several components, but in particular multi-scale dynamics, for example, variations at the level of seasons of, or at the, at the time scale of climate variations. Uh, and which modulate uh, constraints and opportunities available to adaptive agents, for example, in terms of resource availability and exposition to predators. Then, and still in line with this first hypothesis here, uh, environmental complexity drive uh, adaptability uh, in uh, population of agents at at least two different uh, scales, uh, evolutionary scales for natural selection, uh, which uh, tune, let's say, uh, the dynamics of the developmental scale uh, with learning and uh, exploration. Environmental complexity also uh, influences multi-agent dynamics, uh, for example, by providing uh, multimodal channels to the agents for, for their interaction, for example, through vision or through sound, uh, and also in use of game theoretic context, uh, which can be more or less cooperative, more or less competitive, or more uh, mixed. Then, as we have seen before, uh, interaction between adaptability and multi-agent uh, dynamics can lead to some sort of co-adaptation effects, also depending on the game theoretic context. And also, in line with uh, the third hypothesis here, both adaptability and multi-agent dynamics uh, can influence uh, environmental complexity okay, through niche construction mechanisms. Uh, so, uh, so, the interaction between these three first components uh, lead to a first research question which is what are the ecological conditions uh, that can favor the evolution of autotelic agents. And here, by autotelic agents, we mean this type of uh, intrinsically motivated agents that uh, we have presented uh, before. So that, are, uh, that doesn't create necessarily external rewards, but are more driven uh, by their own intrinsic goals and uh, rewards. So how can such agents uh, evolve? Uh, so here our main hypothesis is that they must exist some levels of environmental complexity uh, that uh, can drive the evolution of such behavior as a good solution uh, to uh, survive in rapidly changing environments where uh, it is not easy to predict what will be the changes, basically. We have an evolutionary interest to develop a type of strategy uh, to survive in, uh, in variable environments. Uh, then, as we have seen, uh, another important uh, component of open energy school acquisition is the existence of a cultural repertoire uh, related, for example, to technology, communication, and social organization. And this leads to two other research questions. The first one is how to bootstrap uh, the formation of a cultural repertoire in population of adaptive agents. And here, uh, one of the hypotheses is that uh, the evolution of autotelic agents that are autonomously uh, discovering their own goals in an environment coupled with complex multi-agent dynamics uh, might be sufficient conditions to bootstrap uh, the acquisition of a repertoire of skills that are socially transmitted uh, and are not necessarily related to evolutionary fitness. Can be accidental in the sense. Uh, and then a uh, third research question is uh, what is the role of cultural evolution in the open-ended aspect of human skill acquisition? And here the main hypothesis is that uh, uh, these feedback effects from the cultural repertoire to the other components of the system uh, are, the, are what makes human skill acquisition truly open-ended, open in particular because uh, they can increase environmental complexity. Uh, resulting in this type of positive feedback loops that drive the ever and, and, uh, and the ever and the complexity of the system. Oops. Okay. 
Okay, so yes, so with this framework, basically, uh, we are studying three main research questions uh, that correspond to studying different parts of uh, this conceptual diagram. Uh, and so, uh, now I will just quickly go, uh, like mentioned very quickly in a few sentences, uh, different uh, computational experiments we are doing in this direction, both in the context of this project, but also more largely in the, in the team. Uh, so regarding the first uh, research questions, we are uh, working with LNE on uh, abstract uh, eco-evolutionary models, uh, trying to uh, model how environmental variability uh, can uh, influence uh, the adaptability of agents as the evolutionary and the developmental scale. We are also proposing uh, simulation environments uh, for meta reinforcement learning that are inspired by uh, this type of climate dynamics, which is uh, hypothesized to have given uh, what well, to occur uh, in East Africa a few million years ago. Uh, we are also making models in the domain of artificial life, here at a much lower level, where we are more interested actually in the evolution of uh, sensory motor behavior and skill acquisition at the very first place uh, in, an, in a system actually where there is originally not even a distinction between what is an agent and what is an environment maybe more close to evolutionary biology in this case. Regarding the second research questions, uh, we are working in emergent communication, uh, reviving, let's say, some of the models uh, that we were working uh, a decade ago, but uh, like leveraging new advances in machine learning in order to study uh, more well, different research questions and also uh, learning in more complex spaces. For example, here, agents that learn how to communicate uh, by growing uh, on a, on a piece of uh, simulated paper, let's say. We are also studying collective exploration uh, in multi-agent uh, report for learning, so how a population of agents that all select their own goals uh, can, uh, can uh, acquire strategies to align their goals and discover a wide variety of uh, cooperative skills. And then relating to, uh, related to the third research question, uh, we are interested in collective innovation uh, in multi-agent system. Uh, Eleni will present uh, uh, this contribution uh, a bit later. And also uh, a work that will be presented by Tristan uh, a bit later as well, uh, how compositional language can be leveraged uh, in order to uh, imagine new creative goals in a development learning agent, boosting the exploration abilities. So yeah, this is the tool that will be presented later. Uh, and so, yeah, with, with, with these two next talks, basically, you will see uh, all this uh, type of arrow can, uh, can be uh, concretely uh, represented. And well, that's it. So thank you, everybody, and uh, to any of the collaborators that have been uh, working on this award. Thanks. Questions? I don't know whether it's a question. Okay. While you were presenting, um, I was thinking, um, you mentioned, of course, the huge construction um, and a notion that is often linked to the idea of a niche construction, for example, by Laland, is the idea of the self-domestication. So we would have reached a degree of niche construction that, in fact, uh, um, push them to cross the tipping point. So we, in fact, this self-domestication um, come with advantages and disadvantages because, in fact, you have lost, you have acquired something new, but also you have lost the uh, potential in behavior and way in which you could do things in a previous way. So my, my, my question whether would be um, by, by using a model in the heat, one may reach, uh, one may um, explain when we cross the threshold in the niche construction going to a self domestication. So, in a sense, in self domestication, we, we are losing some of our potential as a species, but we are acquiring something new. I mean, in fact, as in domesticated species. So. Um, I think it would be a very relevant question to understand uh, 
um, when we, where we put the threshold yeah. Yeah. that has uh, created a, 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 a niche that is so specialized that, in fact, we, um, we have lost some of the potential of our species in terms of evolution and even cultural evolution by crossing that threshold. Uh, I was, but I think it's it, 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 it a very, uh, it, it would be a very relevant question to, to address. Since typically this is a type of complex system, with many like speed forward, back loops, etc., uh, there are most likely some, uh, let's say, sharp transition effects. But at some point, for example, in terms of, uh, of future, we could say that, for example, like chimps or birds are, are already some sort of socially transmitted behaviors and already some sort of a social culture. But at which point uh, those like this feedback effect become strong enough, so this type of mini construction feedback effect becomes strong enough so that it can drive actually a positive feedback loop that makes uh, the complexity of the future, uh, well, take a boost, basically. And so, so I think seeing it from uh, like, uh, the complex system perspective is interesting in this, uh, this aspect. Where are the, the major transitions that can, uh, that can occur in just a system? But I think in what you said, there are two, there are two different things. There is the one thing which is the potential uh, nonlinearity in the evolution, uh, reaching a tipping point, uh, and then a sudden uh, brutal change of, of uh, major aspect of the of the culture, for example, but there is another aspect which is, I think, more or less orthogonal, which is the fact that um, uh, as uh, learning for individual and culture for population uh, goes on, there are some uh, discoveries which at the same time are opening uh, or facilitating uh, uh, further progress in some directions, but are closing or making it more difficult to progress in other directions. And I, I think that this is actually related to one of the very fundamental results in machine learning, which is the fact that for any problem, uh, if you want uh, to learn it or to solve it efficiently, you need biases. Um, and there are, it's impossible to build kind of uh, uh, thinking machines, whether they are biological or artificial, which are universally good for all kinds of problems. Um, if you want to be good for certain kinds of problems, you kind of mathematically need to be bad for others. Um, otherwise, uh, I mean, it's not physically possible. Uh, and I think it's, 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 what you say is related to that in the sense that when a culture is making progress in one direction, it's building a niche uh, where it's becoming very good at making better and better and faster and faster at making certain kinds of uh, Innovations and progress, but as a consequence, it's closing down in other directions. Yeah, which we it, don't know. It, it, the closing down some of the possibility is uh, one thing, and the other is that you uh, become unable to come back to a previous situation. Yeah. We, I mean, uh, archaeologically, we see that there are some cases in which people develop very refined, complex techniques that require a lot of investment to be learned. And at some stage, they abandon them, okay. One, which is very contrary, of course, to the idea that there is a progressive evolution. These are situations in which um, perhaps uh, the creation of a human niche is not so, so developed. So uh, you are not crossing what a, a real tipping point in the sense that the tipping point creates a system that is a new system with dramatic changes, and you cannot come back to the previous situation. Um, uh, so this is something that we see, I mean, for example, in Australia, in the Holocene, I mean, when people arrived, I mean, the colonizer, they found uh, um, women in, in Tasmania. Tasmania, is, when people arrived in Tasmania 35,000 years ago, they have very complex technology. And when Tasmania after, became separated from Australia, they missed the link with, uh, with uh, the, the continent. And when the English arrived, they were very, very poor technology. Um, so this is a situation in which, um, uh, fortunately for them, in a sense, uh, they did not create a niche that was specialized, uh, um, too specialized. Otherwise, they would have disappeared. Okay. So they were able to come back. But it, it, so this, this, in this case, 
there's no uh, environmental implication because the landscape, apparently, did not change that much apart from the fact that the very large bird uh, disappeared. But in our indication of our niche, uh, our niche is uh, due to the fact that we have shaped the, the environment. So we, uh, this environment is a new environment that did not exist uh, before. Uh, so we have reached a situation in which we cannot come back. Or perhaps we can, I don't know. But uh, that a, a modeling exercise like this one would be interesting in discussing um, when a human niche cross the threshold and put the species in a situation of no return. Um, <laughs> how, uh, how would you measure cluster mitigation? Will it be like a reduction in the state of the species? How domesticating? How would you measure uh, cluster mitigation? Like, yeah, well, the, 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 so many number of authors said that we have reached a situation in which we have created a process for self domesticating us. So this means that. Uh, because we have domesticated animals, we have created the process in which we, um, I mean, if, technologically, um, we are not the same. So we are not able to, to develop all the potential that we saw in the past. We are becoming extremely specialized. Um, so but then the question becomes, when is the moment in which you cross that there? So people say about self-domestication, but what is self-domestication in a species in which domestication is produced by the species itself? Um, can we identify um, the situation in which you say, okay, this is the threshold. There are these conditions. We unify that make that we cannot come back to the previous situation. But this might look a bit contradictory because if, as you say during your talk, uh, culture evolved in a sense to speed up uh, biological evolution, just to slow to cope with these changes, uh, then this means that culture basically emerged as a way to rapidly adapt to changing conditions. So this idea of having a no return point seems a bit contradictory with this. Um, but perhaps uh, uh, self-domestication happened much, much more recent, uh, recently than the period uh, I mentioned. Perhaps it's something that, in fact, developed in the last 10,000 years, or perhaps... Nothing about agriculture, right? Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. economy of production, but perhaps in a production economy, one of the first production economy, if there was a climate change, people could still come back to uh, hunter-gathering. In fact, we see in some cases that this happened. Um, but um, later on, and there was not changing their environment that much. But now we, of course, reach a situation in which we uh, dramatically change our environment. So, um, in terms of agriculture, for example, well, I'm very biased and uh, don't know much about the field, but I just finished his book from David Graeber that you might have read, I don't know, where he provides some evidence that actually in uh, pre Columbian America, uh, many groups discovered agriculture, but they came back to it, actually. And so, well, providing the thing, the bit, the bit that agriculture is a type of tipping point where we can never come back. Yeah. It seems that some groups came back. But now perhaps we cannot come back. Maybe. So that, um, mm. yeah. so just a, <laughs> an idea that come naturally from what you were saying about the implementing of the model. So the, so the, just to, so that I understand, the no return point isn't coming from a, a cultural lock. It's just like because uh, of the changes we've made to our uh, environment that we cannot. Um, it's not a cultural. Uh, I think the, the two dimensions are, uh, let's say, uh, a real niche. Uh, I mean, as we see it in um, in with domesticated species. Domesticated species live very often or adapted with a domesticated environment. Uh, so we have done the same. We have uh, um, created a, a domesticated environment in which I mean, we are living in a domesticated environment. I mean, we niches, uh, we, we don't live outside, we you know, develop technology, we eat uh, food, food that does not exist in nature. Um, so all this is, is typically, I mean, as we feed the, 
beef or with, I mean, cow with a food that does not exist in nature. We feed ourselves with this type of food. So when this happens, what is the situation in which we, uh, in cultural evolution, we cannot come back to the previous, uh, um, I think it uh, would be an interesting. And does it always have to be like one specific point or is it actually like a spectrum, like maybe we could, but it's so difficult that actually it's not worth it? Or maybe sometimes it's much easier. So like, yeah. I don't know, if there is a new type of technology which develops, and let's imagine for a moment that we don't have writing, so if something is lost in like two or three generations, we can because we just forgot how to do it. Um, and so I guess depending on how complex this technology is, we can go, if it's simple, we can go back to it. If it's more complex, yeah. we can. It could be a, 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 a sequence of tipping point. Okay. Uh, conceive as a sequence of tipping point. Uh, would say, okay, this is, would be still a situation in which one can b come back, and then at the third, fourth, fifth tipping point, you cannot come back. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the first stage is uh, in one in which uh, the environment is not totally modified, while in another one you would be at the very rich, very end mm -hmm. situation in which, uh, of course, there will be no way back. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> in your model, in your model, Clima, where where does population size and structure and interaction between um, uh, in the, the conceptual model, uh, typically in uh, what we call multi-agent dynamics, I would say. Okay. Uh, which is where you... Which is well, where well, the game... Well, well, yeah, well, this is all conceptual, obviously, so there is no implication, <laughs> but this is where we basically uh, introduce the idea of a game theoretic context. Okay. Which is related to, yeah. Population interact together. Although they can be locked as well. Maybe you are locked not culturally, but just because you are in a, in a bad nice equilibrium, yeah, let's say. Where we, yeah, where you might not have a lot of internet to cooperate, for example. The, the other issue is how, starting from this modeling, one can add uh, data that may try to see whether it is able to test in a sense of reality. So what we know archaeologically, uh, for example, in a way would be to, um, to add the chronological um, frame, frame uh, and see, okay, things have changed apparently at a different rate, with what you were mentioning, okay. Um, so how we use that uh, as, a, as, a, as a meter see, perhaps the mechanism is the same, but uh, it does not work the same way in different periods, starting two million years ago, how we see this changing. So that, that would be, let's say, if, if, you, if you add these parameters and you uh, um, uh, calibrate the parameters in a way that would fit the archaeological reality, one would say, okay, but there we see tipping point because there are clear change in the rate. At this point, this point, this point, this point. So these have implication for the way in which the model is conceived and the various agents are interacting. This type of data are available? So, so this type of data are available? For example, like paleoclimatology with cultural rate. Uh, well, the public paleoclimatology, I mean, that will be. Can, okay. well, Francesco, but can I stop you? Because otherwise, I'm never, I'm not going to have anything to say during my presentation <laughs> <Okay>. right now. <laughs> I've been just <laughs> stepping on. But if you put it on our stuff, the media is going to be connected to the internet. Please, what that in
So it's actually uh, quite a good opportunity because you asked if there is um, data that we could actually uh, test hypothesis and models. And there was also another question with regard to uh, the rate of change by uh, Pierre. Um, and so today what I wanted to do is just to uh, present to you, like to make a little trip back in time uh, uh, on a specific aspect of material culture that I'm uh, studying, which is osseous technologies. Huh? Um, and bringing this also with Francesco's uh, idea of tipping point uh, to try to look back in the last two million years if there's any tipping point that we can see and uh, try and how also are we explaining these, uh, these trends that we're seeing from the archaeological uh, records. But just to start, uh, I want to give you a few definitions so we are all on the same page. Uh, um, first of all, when I'm talking of osseous technology, it's any hard animal material. So it could be bone, antler, shell, uh, ivory, teeth, um, anything that is hard from uh, animals. And then uh, I'm going to talk about three different categories, broad categories of technology. Um, the first one is uh, expedient tools, which includes both unmodified osseous fragments that are bearing clear traces of their use in, uh, uh, in uh, technological or statistical activities. Uh, and uh, the second category of tool within the expedient tool is the um, um, osseous fragments that are partially modified with techniques that are usually used to shape stone tools. And so these are um, partially modified ones. And then we have the formal bone tools, which are which are osseous fragments that are entirely shaped with techniques that are adapted to shaping bone. Uh, and with the intention of, uh, uh, of imposing a shape with a high degree of precision. So those are uh, formal bone tools. Huh? So um, first of all, why is it interesting or why should we study bone technologies? Um, well, although we have evidence actually from captive uh, uh, different species of monkeys, huh? when subjected to scarcity in raw material, they will use bone for, different, for conducting different activities. Um, the systematic use of bone is something that is specific, that is unique. It's a behavior that is unique to our, to our lineage. And it also, um, the, the first evidence of bone uh, use for subsistence activity in the archaeological record is usually um, interpreted as signaling a shift in how past uh, population perceive the potential of animal resources at, this, at their disposal. So in addition to meat, hide, uh, marrow, uh, fuel, um, the bones are becoming actually, uh, they're becoming of interest uh, to carry out different subsistence activities and this is the reason why we're studying them. So the trip that I'm um, going to invite you on is going to be over the last two million years, uh, and we're going to look at the old world to have a broad perspective. Uh, um, and you will see um, that some characteristics are shared in different regions uh, of the old world. So the first question is, where does bone technology appear first? It appears in South and East Africa, almost contemporaneously. Um, and although it appears to be in convergent evolution in these two areas, uh, in the, the fact of using bone uh, for technological purposes, the way it, is, uh, it materialized was quite di di distinct between the two areas. So first in South Africa, we're seeing bone, um, um, expedient bone tools uh, that are almost never shaped, but that bear clear traces uh, of their use to dig termite mounds uh, and perhaps also um, crack some fruits. Uh, and these are appearing between 2.4 and 9.6, uh, uh, 2.4 million years ago to 900,000 years before present. Uh, they are found in association with two big culture that we call the Old One and the Echelian. And um, they have been found in association with the last members of the Paranthropus uh, 
uh, lineage and the first members of the uh, Homo um, uh, genus, which is Homo erectus. Uh, in East Africa, um, those uh, the first bone technologies are, uh, in addition to the unmodified ones, we have NAP bone tools also that are appearing around 2 million years before present. Uh, uh, NAP in the same way as making hand axes, for instance. And they have been found also in association with Aldo and cutting tool, Escholian hand axes between 2 million uh, years before present, all the way until 800,000 years before present, in association most likely with Homo erectus uh, remains. Um, so this is the first uh, tipping point. And between the first and the second tipping point, we have rare evidence actually that um, of, um, of the use of bone either for symbolic purposes with these engravings that come from Trinil and dated by almost 5, 000, uh, 500,000 years ago, and a hand axe made of elephant bone. But although uh, the period between the first tipping point and the second one um, is fairly large, the evidence that we have from the archaeological record, despite being few, it, it seems to be, um, 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 it seems to indicate that from the moment where bone were introduced in previous technological system, they were never um, taken out of it. They, there was always a continuous reliance on it to variable degrees. The second tipping point is occurring in Europe, um, and this is where we see actually a functional diversification of the bone that are uh, used. We see still the hand axes that are uh, uh, um, produced, uh, uh, but we also see a wide variety of bone tools that are appearing actually in the archaeological record. And research conducted over the last um, uh, five years in Lingjing uh, appears to indicate actually that the functional diversification that we're seeing in Europe between 350 and 300,000 years, 300, years before present is also something uh, that could apply actually to East Asia. So it seems to be a, um, a phenomenon that is covering the whole of Eurasia and not only uh, Western Eurasia. Uh, but throughout, uh, from the beginning all the way until there, it's always, we're always talking about expedient tools. And the first bone tools, the first formal bone tools that are appearing are appearing, it's, it's a recent uh, uh, um, it's, some, it's a recent phenomenon, and it's appearing around 90,000. It, it, it occurs in Africa between 90,000 and, and 60,000 years before present. And as soon as they appear in Africa, they appear in a very structuralized uh, or uh, in a structurally, in a regionally structuralized, structurized way. Uh, so it, it seems actually that the type of bone tool that we're creating, uh, we're, we're creating bone tools with specific shapes actually depending on the region. Uh, in North Africa, we're having these uh, uh, bone tools that are elongated uh, and appears to have been used actually perhaps to um, work uh, hide. In Central Africa, we have these harpoons that are magnificent and very well shaped. And in South Africa, we have a whole, a whole diversity of point, especially pointed and beveled tools that are created during that period of time. And quite interestingly is that although, um, for instance, in South Africa, we published a recent paper that highlighted that despite the fact that um, we, have, uh, uh, we have cultural changes in the lithic technology, other aspects of material culture, here the, um, the bevel tools are maintained for over 20,000 years uh, uh, while other aspects of, of, of material culture is changing. Quite interestingly, um, as Francesco mentioned, um, the appearance of personal ornament, which is also made of, or, of uh, hard animal material, uh, occurred from roughly 140,000 years before present, but both personal ornament and bone tool disappear from the archaeological record at around 60,000 years before present. 
And these two items of material culture will reappear, but this time across the old world in different regions at around 45,000 years before present. And when we're looking at this specific tipping point, we see that there's a major emphasis in um, making productile technologies. And so the question that arises is why different populations living with different cultural backgrounds, living in different environments, converge in producing actually a, um, a, a piece of material culture that is uh, directed towards the same problem at about the same time. So this is the brief overview. I'm not going to just, it's just, we could talk hours about this, and I don't think it's the, it's the point of this thing. The um, one point that I would like to say is that from that fourth um, tipping point, where we see bone technology is appearing in different, uh, various regions of, uh, of the world, we are equipped with tools uh, uh, and that allows us, uh, thanks to the fact that the shape imposed on the bone is very regular, that allows us actually to track back uh, um, cultural phylogenies, uh, for instance, uh, with specific bone tools. In this case, bone needles, uh, but the same could be uh, also done with other tools. And it allows us also to um, investigate cultural dynamic uh, for um, specific regions. For instance, here, the diversity of personal ornaments that uh, are in North China between 40 and 10,000 years before present. So, and that allows us actually to see uh, patterns that are closely matching what we see um, or what are suggested by the latest evidence in, um, from paleogenetics. Yeah. For example, to give you this example in China, we've discovered that east of this line that is roughly uh, at the 112th parallel, um, uh, what we have is uh, basically um, personal ornaments that are in majority made on uh, teeth, uh, animal teeth and shell. Well, on the west of this, it's mainly uh, ostrich egg shell bees that are used, most likely uh, in combination actually with uh, feathers from diurnal and nocturnal raptors. And basically, we're now becoming more and more equipped to look at uh, population dynamic from different different aspects of uh, of material culture of the material culture we're analyzing some issues remain unresolved and the thing is in archaeology or pre yeah in archaeological studies uh, um, cultural change is often looked either as being the response to pressure either from the environment and the social system but there is very limited um, studies that are looking into the internal dynamic of the cultural system and their effect, actually, uh, the effect of these reorganizations through time uh, on both the environmental system and uh, the environmental system and the social system as well. And this is basically uh, where studies um, ahead are, are, are being uh, take, uh, undertaken right now to answer this, this problem. And so if we're looking at the environment, just to um, assuming that environmental system and, culture and social system are the main component that um, uh, affect the, uh, the change in material culture, if we're projecting the four tipping point that I talked to you about on this for the environment, there is not really any one-to-one -one ratio or correlation that can be drawn between what we see in changes in material culture and the key uh, global uh, temperatures, actually, that we're observing in the world. And this is probably because we're looking at two different scales. Global trend in temperatures are probably not fit to explain cultural changes that are occurring at a local level. 
And unfortunately, the data we have available for um, the uh, climatic in, uh, or environmental data we have at a local level is either insufficient or uh, inexistent uh, uh, to address these issues. So we have to think about other things. Huh? Now, if we're looking in terms of society, um, what are the social or the, 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 the let's say, mechanism and processes that could explain cultural evolution, we could fairly say that cumulative culture may be responsible for this whole part all the way until formal, the appearance of formal bone tools. But when formal bone tools are appearing in the archaeological record, this is becoming more and more complex. And what we're we have two questions, basically, that are unresolved and that perhaps AI could help us with, uh, is how can we explain <clears throat> the simultaneous disappearance of formal bone tools and body ornaments circa 60,000 years before present? And uh, is it... Uh, and the second question would be, what are the social and environmental pressure that played a role actually for the lasting reappearance of formal bone tools circa uh, 40 to 50,000 years before present? Now, modeling, as I understand it, is trying to um, extract or, uh, or limit the number of parameters actually uh, used in order to um, get conclusion. From what I'm seeing from Clément's presentation, there seems to be something actually that is quite, um, it can become more and more complex. And it would be interesting perhaps to put global trends in environment as being the main pressure. And also perhaps um, major events in migration, for example, the out of Africa um, uh, uh, migrations that are occurring to see how these uh, could have affected basically the rate of cultural change uh, and, and so on. So I'm leaving it to that. I just wanted to give you an overview of the thing so we uh, we can have to expand on the discussion of this. Uh, a question, uh, so, so you said that there was no correlation between global climate and uh, and uh, events in terms of shifting in cultural uh, practices, which is, uh, I mean, it's okay, it's understandable because it's global climate uh, uh, data. But uh, for example, looking at uh, simulations for uh, the future of our climate, uh, we, we see that some of the existing models are able to provide information on local temperatures. So yeah. I'm assuming that there might be some. There are attempts that are there are models that are doing this actually for the past climate, but these models usually don't. The resolution actually of these models is fairly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's it's we're not to the point of saying like oh in the Dordogne region it was. No, it's actually like we're having, and there are downscaling um, algorithms that are used actually to uh, to see um, what is basically the uh, how do these climate uh, climate model um, um, were impacted with local topography, for instance, or influence of uh, major wind current, especially when you're closer to the coast or further from the coast, mm -hmm. um, but the resolution is still not very precise where we could have, for instance, uh, a very clear view of the thing. Plus, these models, I mean, past 120, 150,000 years before present, uh, the resolution of these models is even less. Um, uh, ideal, specifically because there are people currently working on on making uh, on trying to understand what were the characteristic of these environments at a global scale. 
but maybe if I understand well your question, um, a global climate change won't have the same outcome in different regions of the planet, and in yes. some cases may have even have opposite outcome in different regions of the planet. So this means that we um, we should not necessarily expect the same impact of the climate change in different. That's why um, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, um, we may rather expect different cultural trajectories in different parts, which does not mean that there is a, a determinism in the, how people, what people would do in that, mm -hmm. but so people could take a choice or another, that uh, the, um, things may, may develop uh, into different regions in two different ways triggered by the same climatic change because the climate change won't have, won't have the same effect. Okay, But at the same time, we see here a sort of long-term trend um, which may be uh, characterized by tipping point. Uh, and, but even in this case, for example, at the beginning we're showing two, in, in Africa two different traditions more or less are happening at the same time. One in which bone is modified as it was a stone and another in which just bone is used as such. So this, I, and this probably happened even in two different dominants. So a situation in which uh, we have two different cultural traditions, two trajectories, and they disappear. Mm -hmm. But after that, we have uh, no new napping, and we have some formal tool, and after this formal tool disappear. But this is something that we see in Africa, because there are no basically bone tools uh, or just uh, bone used to, reta to, to retouch flint in Europe. So we have um, um, different situation going on. Okay. Um, so let's say there are general trends, uh, and at the same time things happening locally. Yes, but the general trends. I mean, these trends are aside from this one, which is the appearance of for, uh, formal bone tool between 90 and, and 60,000 years before present. These trends seem to be pretty much. I'd say global to an extent, because when we're seeing, for instance, in China, the first Homo erectus arriving in China, we're also having what appears to be evidence of nap bone tools that are pretty much the same as those that we see in East Africa from the beginning until 800,000 years. And this Gap we have in the archaeological yes. record. But look, I, no, I, I, just to give a sort of full, uh, in, um, if I try to play the devil's advocate, um, let's say there are also many, um, many um, facts that we are not able to explain. Oh, yes. So, and or, you know, beyond the the, the general trend. Uh, we have, you know, people may, uh, producing stone tool in China one million years ago, and we don't mean now. Apparently, there is one possible by face, but you know, we don't really know in many parts of the world in which people are napping one million years ago why these people do not produce bone tools. Okay, um, needle bone needles appear in China and they appear in Europe uh, oh, maybe 15,000 years later. They appear in. Russia almost at the same yeah. time as in China. Yeah. But I mean, in Europe, they arrived much. So why these people that were living in a glacial environment in Europe, they have not produced needles for 10,000 years while the Chinese were using needles? So this also supports the idea that there are regional, different regional cultural trajectories. Absolutely. Um, so there are asynchronicity that show that things do not happen at the same time in the same way to answer some um, climatic situation, but there are people inventing some stuff in some area and not in others. And after either by independent invention or by cultural transfer, things arrive in the other region. And in many cases, archaeologists are not, uh, are not well uh, in a well position to establish whether it's a cultural transfer or just independent invention. So I say, there is a general trend, but many things that are not really explained within the general trend. Absolutely, and there's like just and when we're looking, for instance, at the difference we're seeing um, when I was talking to you about the fact that stone tool is changing in this 20,000 years, but we're having exactly the same type of bone tools that is being reproduced. 
not only reproduce, but also use for the same reason. This is something actually we're seeing very often in, in our, with the archaeological records. Is sometimes you could have a cultural change that has ramification on many other aspects of material culture. And other times, you will have the maintenance of a cultural item over millennia while everything else is basically changing. And so these are the dynamics also, like what are the internal dynamic of a techn technological system? To what extent actually making one change in the cultural has, uh, uh, system has ramification on the other component of the system, but also with other systems with, it, it, with, with which it is uh, interacting, for example, the environmental system or the social system at the same time. These are questions that... I mean, if, if there is a question that I would ask uh, to um, um, people doing the kind of modeling that you have shown is uh, how this modeling can uh, model the asynchronicity between the, the emergence of these inventions. Because when we perhaps I mean, if, you, if you make a model, or say these, these uh, agents interact, they increase their performance, etc. But there are cases, apparently archaeologically, in which people, I mean, increase their performance, reach a point, create an innovation, etc. And that, uh, in which perhaps for 10,000 years, 20,000, 4,000 years, the people that perhaps were submitted to similar uh, ecological constraints, they do not do it. Yeah, I think we will have some, well, during the presentation of LNE, uh, I think it will uh, help also to, to see a bit how this kind of model can, uh, can model this kind of phenomenon. But the, the global mechanism, I think, is that uh, even so, there is, like, say, a clear uh, path, like logical, well, a, a clear final point, let's say. Like, for example, using bone tools is what makes the most sense in this type of environment. You might still have many different trajectories to uh, go to it that can lead to differences in, like, the, for example, the record, uh, mm -hmm. the record you get. Um, well, let's say, you, in, in a technical system, you can have different ways to solve a problem. Okay, mm -hmm. you can solve the problem by making point with the, with the stone, and make point with bone or ivory, etc. So uh, the time, let's say, the point is just uh, the point of what is close to the point. So is what the way in which you are making the glue, the making of which of the string, the way the type of wood that you would have, etc. So it's a whole uh, story. And uh, um, uh, of course, in, in a given environment and given people would rather go to a um, so more higher sophistication of a lithic point, and in another case, they would rather go to the ball point. Um, so, um, uh, they say, how, um, how uh, they say, train in different environment agent may go to one direction or another direction is, would be a, is a very interesting question. And the second one is uh, how people that uh, are you know, perhaps work, living in different environment, at some stage, some people develop something and some other people would develop the same, but uh, 10 or 20 or 20,000 years later. Um, while yeah. the basic initial conditions are pretty similar. Yeah, but I think that the, the two kinds of, of things you mentioned, we are observing similar things in uh, various models. So on the one hand, um, um, for example, on models of uh, language evolution, so you can see uh, language elements as, as particular kinds of technologies. and. Uh, uh, in, in the models, for example, in the, in the models of, of, of shared vocalization that came on I worked on, but, but a number of other models, uh, it's relatively common to have uh, a model in which you start from the same environment, the same parameter, the same mechanism, exactly, uh, but, there, but then due to very small changes in the, in the initial uh, uh, state, uh, it falls into one of multiple attractors. Uh, which can be very, very different, and attractors are not all of the same size, so there, there, there are some attractors in which it, it falls very often, and this is what we call regularities, and sometimes, but rarely, uh, the same system falls into another attractor, but it's pretty rare, 
And then this is, but then there are, for example, I mean, one could say, okay, perhaps the population size that you were mentioned, the population size may play a role in that. The degree of connectivity between groups could be also how, um, for example, there was in, in a paper in the PNAS by the uh, Feldman group in which they tried to see how climate, uh, you see that in fact, uh, if you're, you have a technology that is a simple technology and cross different climate change, uh, the technology would be, um, would uh, survive. But if you have a relatively complex technology that is uh, uh, conceived specifically so to one re type of resources within a type of environment, if this is submitted to very uh, quick, continuous climate change, the chances are very high that you will lose, lose that uh, cultural trait, which is uh, advantageous only in that type of environment, and you won't come back, and it will take very long for this type of innovation to come back. So, and perhaps there is also a matter of chance. Yeah, but well, that's why I'm saying, so again, I think we are observing some of those models some of those mechanisms, like again, if we take the examples of the evolution of vocalization, um, uh, like the, the, the vocal track uh, is nonlinear, and there are certain, because of the nonlinearities, there are certain systems of sound which are physically much more stable than others in the face of noise, uh, for example, for enabling uh, communication. And if we increase the noise, it, it will tend to have the, like uh, if you launch uh, 1,000 populations of individuals, if we increase the noise, you will have more individuals falling in uh, certain kinds of attractors which are very robust than others. If you decrease the noise, there will be more, more diversity. But, but fundamentally, the, the diversity is, is, um, is, uh, is in big part due to um, uh, the arbitrariness of uh, very like, uh, small and insignificant differences which through snowball effects and positive feedback loops get the population in one uh, on, on, on the other one, exactly. That's, that's, uh, that's the, so, so actually, uh, the, that's the famous picture from Conrad Wellington, who wanted to explain uh, uh, embryogenesis uh, and how the, the maybe the, the, the uh, same uh, same uh, uh, genome uh, can lead to. Mm -hmm. uh, a variety of uh, biological structure, but most of the time some genome leads to the same one, but sometimes it leads to other, and it's, it's a bit similar to like having this ball rolling out uh, through the, the rules of physics and biology uh, down the slope. There are some, uh, some, uh, some uh, valleys that are much bigger than others, it, it's where, where most people go, but sometimes because of random fluctuations it gets into other. Um, and, and I think it plays, a, this kind of internal intrinsic dynamics plays a very large role in many systems. Um, Never buy a connected watch. It's a little gift. Connected watch with connected. And also related to your second point about like, making discoveries at very, at very different time. Uh, for example, in the, in the domain of machine learning, uh, there are families of algorithms that uh, Clément mentioned, reinforcement learning algorithms, or in, more recently we call them deep reinforcement learning algorithms because they, they use some kind of deep neural network. But um, what's very typical in these algorithms is that before they learn, they need to see at least a few times examples of good solutions, which then they can refine. Uh, and for many problems, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to, to, to find the first examples of solutions by chance. And the only way to find them is just to try randomly. And if you run the same algorithm in the same environment with the same problem, everything is the same, you just change uh, the random seed, uh, which is like very small variation. You can have the, like, uh, the, the same algorithm sometimes find very quickly the solution, sometimes very slowly finding solution, sometimes never finding the solution. But it's exactly the same algorithm in exactly the same environment. Um, well, for your question, yes, we can model this. <laughs> in fact, actually for us, this kind of thing is, is like from the, the point of view of AI and not modeling uh, human properties, this is something that's extremely common and that's a major problem we try to solve in terms of building machines where we can predict uh, well, like their outcome. Because 
when you want to be the machine that's going to solve a problem in a predictable manner, this is a bad property because you want them to, like, more or less all the time, learn a particular kind of things with the same amount of time. Uh, and this is very difficult to build an algorithm which is going to achieve this. It's very easy to achieve what, to, to build an algorithm that is going to sometimes learn fast, sometimes learn slow, sometimes never learn. <laughs> Getting the same solution with different environments uh, is more complex. Uh, the same solution is different environments. Mm. It can happen as well. Yeah, it can happen as well. Yeah. Yeah. If it's uh, a good solution that solves all the environments. Yeah. yeah. But for example, if you look at uh, the, the example that Perry was mentioning on like uh, phonological systems uh, where the distribution is far from uniform, there are like clear tendencies in different world languages. Uh, well, it's usually different people, different cultures, different groups that don't entirely communicate together, yet they converge toward quite often the same systems because for environmental or sensory motor reasons, these are the, the most obvious ones or the more attractive ones. In evolution as well, uh, there are like many examples of convergent evolution. Uh, for example, like I think the morphology of the crabs has been reproduced uh, quite a few times in evolution in different models. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it would be interesting to discuss a bit more about. Uh, well, we we'll definitely need to discuss a bit more, but to see if actually the, the kind of model we have, where as Perry said. Typically, observe this kind of uh, of uh, deviations mm -hmm. just from small initial conditions. I could be interesting to see if it could be applied to the type of problem you are considering. Yeah, yeah. Is there a question? What okay. time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, my presentation in uh, my work in uh, contact uh, networks uh, during the past 10,000 years ago uh, in the Western Mediterranean uh, during the transition of the Mesolithic to the Neolithic in uh, Europe. Um, my work has been always done in uh, genetics and uh, biodiversity and evolution uh, with later an emphasis in uh, networks. I work with uh, uh, my former PI in uh, Todi Boudini working uh, networks for uh, ecological systems, modeling ecological systems uh, to perturbations. And then I moved here to, to Bordeaux to work uh, with Solange Rigo first in her uh, momentum project, working in network modeling during the transition period in, uh, from Mesolithic to the Neolithic period. And now uh, with the uh, GPR Human Past uh, group uh, working in the analytic anal uh, network analysis applied to the spread of innovations during this uh, transition period. So um, my work, as I said, it was divided into two kinds of networks. The first type of network that I worked was uh, uh, qualitative uh, modeling uh, of complex systems and their response to perturbations. And this was uh, done using uh, what is called uh, loop analysis, a methodology developed uh, in the 70s by uh, Richard Levin that takes the description of uh, complex systems and then use a kind of digraph network like this uh, to uh, calculate the predictions of the system response when there's an input such as uh, perturbation to the system as pollution. Uh, I work then to uh, extend the calculation procedures and uh, the applications of uh, the loop analysis and develop the uh, R package, Levin's analysis, and uh, we did an uh, analysis of the Caspian Sea ecological system because it's a system uh, that's been uh, with a lot of pressures during the last uh, 100 years. And we uh, applied that to see uh, how the system has responded to the different pressures so we could see how to better rep uh, reply to those pressures to get uh, uh, the system to recover. So uh, basically what the, the loop analysis <coughs> takes is uh, what it's called uh, it takes normally in food chains what you have it's a predator prey for instance and you have a direct link from one to the other. This is very limited because you can uh, re re 
represent the system only using one type of interaction, the predator prey. But in systems, sometimes we have competitions, we have uh, mutualism, and so on. What we do with uh, loop analysis is we take a, what's called a sign directed graph, and we take the qualitative relationship to a status. So, for instance, on uh, predator prey, we have a positive effect from the prey to the predator, and we have a negative effect from the. <laughs> and we have a negative effect from the predator to the prey. So that way we can include the competition uh, relationships where there's both a positive effect from one to the other, negative uh, relationships uh, uh, such as uh, uh, competition, mutualism is positive, and we can also include, like uh, we see many times, if there's uh, an abundance of resources, the species will grow. But if the species grows, there's uh, less resources. So there's a kind of self-balance in the, the system. So we can also include that with the self-loops. And uh, what this uh, loop analysis does in uh, comparison with other predictive models is that not only takes the uh, I think we lost the sound, or at least I lost the sound. Yeah, same. Yeah, me too. Wow. <laughs> you can hear us? Yes, it works. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So what the, the loop analysis takes in uh, compared with other uh, methodologies to predict the changes in the environment is not only take the, uh, in consideration the direct effect that perturbations have on the entry variable, on the entry species, and the relationship that that species has with their direct relationship species, like uh, the predator with uh, its prey, but also takes into consideration the rest of the network, because if you imagine a network, uh, for instance here, any entry point that you make not only has a relationship with, uh, with the direct, uh, with the other direct species, but it also spreads throughout the rest of the system, and this causes a feedback loop that eventually will come back to the original point of the species, of the entry point. And what we get is a, what we call a table of predictions that we get for each uh, row. There's the entry point, and we predict if there's a positive uh, input, uh, for instance, on species B, say, like a mutation that causes uh, an increase in the birth rate, how it will affect the rest of the system. And uh, this is a very simple case, but uh, it's very useful for complex systems where we have multiple variables. Sometimes the effect of the the different the feedback loops that come back to the to through the system, it will cause uh, some uh, some of the results that we get to be counter sensors of what we we would expect, and we actually see that uh, traditional methods of prediction for systems, they usually sometimes fail because they introduce a species that will help with that problem, but then it causes other problems in the system that are not predictable because of this kind of uh, self feedback of the the system. So what, uh, what we did is, that because it's a qualitative analysis, but when uh, previous uh, postdocs of my uh, PI uh, introduced it to R, they uh, used a quantitative background. That helps us because, again, there's multiple paths from one species to the other than through the system. And sometimes these paths, they have different signs. It will cause a positive effect from A to B, but through another path, it will cause a negative effect. And through the qualitative analysis, it's simple when you have five, six species to discern the, the, the end result, but when you have 20 species, it's very hard. So they introduced a quantitative background to eliminate that. And what I did is to extend the, these calculations, I developed an analysis that allows us to model the interaction strength between the different species, uh, because a, a predator will not predate the same way on two different species, and the way that the strength that interacts, the different paths, they will carry the information differently. Uh, we're also able to introduce concurrent input analysis because uh, on a system you usually don't have just one point of entry, one perturbation occurring. Sometimes you have pollution, you have overfishing, uh, you have multiple stresses occurring at the same time that will uh, have their effects uh, intermingling. And then we also uh, were able to introduce an analysis for the path and the feedback analysis to study which of the different pathways, not only the species that we want to see and observe how it affects, 
but also there are different pathways which one would be best to act if you want to act on the system. So now for the, my work, my current work on the Neolithic. Uh, uh, briefly, the Neolithic uh, appeared and uh, spread from the Fertile Crescent into Europe, uh, where it lasted from 8,200 to 6,000 BPE. It was a major demographic uh, event affecting culturally and genetic the populations in Europe, with input from uh, farmer populations into Europe and uh, in local process of admixture with the hunter-gatherer populations. Uh, we see settlement development, population increase, uh, uh, development of tools, and so on. Um, my work, it relies on the cultural evolution uh, theory that states that the emergence persistent and loss of cultural traits over time, uh, it's impacted by a cultural selection process, selection bias, and cultural drift. Uh, we also note that uh, items that fulfill uh, exclusive symbolic uh, function, uh, they are generally considered more useful than uh, artifacts that have a functional uh, function. <laughs> for detecting cultural affinities between uh, populations and patterns of uh, change through time. Uh, such an example of uh, items fulfilling exclusive symbolic functions are, for instance, uh, beads, uh, personal ornaments that are very uh, important for uh, self-identity. So uh, these are some of the work that uh, were previously done uh, by uh, Solange Rigaud. And what she found is that uh, there is a, a barrier between the uh, the north and the southern Europe, and the bit type diversity and the geographical distance, they are slightly correlated. And then looking for, uh, specifically for the western Mediterranean area, uh, comparing the different proxies of the material culture, personal ornament, and uh, pottery decoration techniques, she found that there were different mechanisms of transmission between the, these different uh, traits, with bit type diversity attesting for the circulation and intense circulation of ideas uh, and populations while the, the conservation of uh, the, the, uh, the space and time diversity of uh, the pottery decorative techniques um, uh, highlight the importance of uh, this uh, proxy of the material culture for group and membership. So from the work that uh, she has done, some questions were still left uh, that we want to explore using a network analysis. That is to evaluate the amount of cultural traits between, uh, shared between the different groups, how the cultural diversity is expressed uh, through the network, uh, if there was any uh, cultural sites or group of sites that dominated the structure of the network in terms of the, the, the sharing and the similarities of these uh, B types, for instance, and if these relationships, uh, they uh, change uh, through time, and uh, to see if, uh, for the two different uh, material cultures that we have, if uh, the network expresses a higher level of uh, assemblage across those populations. Uh, I used uh, two different uh, data sets, personal elements and uh, pottery traits, uh, collected uh, uh, by my colleagues. We have 49 early Neolithic uh, archaeological occupations uh, in the Western Virginia area, uh, for which we have coded 88 uh, B types. And uh, we have 44 early Neolithic archaeological occupations, also from the same area, encoded for 11 uh, quantitative variables of the pottery uh, decoration <coughs> techniques. They both span a similar time, 1,500 years, and they are both encoded for the different uh, classically defined archaeological uh, cultures. And we also have for each of uh, their uh, good uh, radiocarbon dating that we can use for a time series analysis. So here we have uh, our uh, networks. These are uh, what we can call similarity networks. Each, uh, each uh, node on our network represents an archaeological occupation, and each link re uh, reflects the level of similarity between the assemblages present for each occupation. With uh, the thicker the edge or the heavier the edge, the, the higher the similarity between those two occupations is. And each site is also color coded by the archaeological culture. So, this is our network for the personal ornaments. And what we get from here, uh, very uh, succinctly, is like we have no clusters. Uh, we observe no clusters, that is, no group of highly interconnected uh, nodes uh, with that sharing a high level of relationship. Uh, and we also see that independently of, uh, you can see by the colors, independently of the archaeological. Uh, uh, culture that each occupation would belong, they do tend to form relationships 
with other occupations, even if they are from a different archaeological culture. All of that paired with the fact that uh, the level of uh, uh, similarities that we observe for our network do express that we have a high level of uh, diversity in uh, this kind of material culture in uh, beads. And it also points to the fact that there were some bead types that they were shared widely across uh, time and across the geographical landscape and the cultural landscape. When we look at the, the same kind of networks that we did for our potteries, what we do see is a very high contrast because here now we do have two very uh, big clusters of uh, occupations all coalescing together and they both do tend to be, even though here they are different colors, they all represent, uh, they belong to the same uh, major group of uh, archaeological culture. They are different regional expressions of the same archaeological culture in the two of them. Here we have cardial, there we have uh, epicardial. And we also see that most of uh, our strong uh, links, the heavy links, the high levels of similar, they do tend to be shared within the same archaeological cultures or uh, the ones that are very similar. And again, uh, taking comparison the, the results of our Instagram, we do see that the, versus the, the personal ornaments, we have a high level of similarity expressed uh, for the pottery trade. And this is again indicative of uh, that for these traits, uh, for pottery, uh, decorative techniques, they were very important for group membership. So that's why these traits, they do tend to be shared closely uh, together with the same uh, uh, culturally similar occupations. We also wanted to look uh, if there was any uh, occupations, any side or group of sides. Okay, so long as the right, okay. uh, just stop for in moment, she will come up. I will. I will. Sure. Well, you can continue. I will. I will. Uh, I come back. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so we can start with questions. Ah. Oh, if you have a question. <laughs> well, so long as it's I think she will be interested too. So. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's say um, perhaps more than a question to make things clear to you uh, about the, the first paper. So long presented. You, you summarized it quite quickly. Um, this was the result of the uh, PhD thesis. Um, so one one interesting point in in, in this paper was that uh, um, um, we, based on on the personal ornament, we see um, a very different pattern between the southern Europe. So we, we have to know that in fact the Neolithic. So the uh, production economies arrived in Europe through two different ways. One coming into the Mediterranean, which is called the Impresta ceramic, ceramics, and one with, through Germany called the Linian Band Ceramic. Um, and, and so the, when we look at beads, this is a comparison between the beads used by the last Mesolithic, so the last people who were undergathered in Europe, and the arriving people that are bringing production economies. And this apparently results in very two different processes because in one case uh, there is an almost uh, complete substitution of the personal ornament. So the new people arrive with their personal ornaments that are quite different and they impose, uh, which is also a result of a demographic process. While in the other case there are people arriving, but the, 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 what we see is a continuity in the use of the personal ornament. So apparently, which probably is also the reflection of other aspects of their clothing, because you know the personal ornaments are often also attached on on uh, on also. And, and also in a sense, the personal ornaments we think that are the reflection of the vision of the world. So that they seem to be <laughs> in spite of dramatic change in um, in economy. So I think that the, the, the new countries are, are absorbed by local people rather than the people arriving and substituting the So this was the beginning of the interesting pattern. Okay, so I'll show you this one. So like I was saying, we wanted also to look if uh, there was uh, any site or group of sites, any pattern that we could discern. Sites uh, that were dominating the, the structure of the network. 
uh, for that we took uh, two, uh, two, uh, two informations. Uh, node centralities that uh, give us the information, the importance of each individual node. Uh, and then we also took graph uh, centralities, the corresponding that gives us the information of how those nodes for that specific uh, centrality, how they dominate the network. Uh, first of all, if we look at the, the top ranking uh, nodes, what we saw is that there is no clear pattern or structure coming from uh, the top ranking of those nodes. And then uh, this is also confirmed by uh, our graph setup that we got very low values. And this is indicative that uh, for the personal uh, ornaments, we have no site or group of sites or cultures dominating the structure of the network. So, sorry, a very naive question. But I'm not sure I fully understood what exactly the graph is showing. So could you just say again what is a node and what is a link? The nodes are the occupations, uh, the size. And the link reflects the amount of similarity between their assemblages. Okay. And so the so links, they have a number associated to them. Yes, so the higher the, the similarity between uh, the two uh, assemblages, if they share a lot of uh, the same techniques, the same portrait de techniques, they will have a, a thicker edge, so they have a higher level of similarity. If they share nothing in common, they won't have uh, any link. And the sites come from different uh, time, time scales? Yes, they cover a span of 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. yep. So some of these sites, even though they have a link between them, they were not uh, mm -hmm. occurring at the yeah. same time. Okay. And uh, geography is kind of not taken into account in the similarity, or it is? No, just not taken. Yeah, no, no, no. We can also, we could plot it uh, covering the geographical, uh, yeah. telling each point to be, but uh, we use a best fit model. Because otherwise we have some sites that are either so close or they are exactly on the same spot that you couldn't see it. So you would just see one uh, instead of 44, yeah, yeah. you have 30. So that's so it, like the location of the points on this graph are yeah, like, uh, geographical no, position? Not here. Another here it's a best fit model that we use ah, okay. to give us a clear picture of the relationships. Okay. Yeah, because otherwise we would have more or less like a, a kind of a C shape because mm -hmm. it's the Western Mediterranean yeah. like Southern France. And most of the sites were like overlapping. We wouldn't be able to discern the sure. relationship between most of them. And so, okay. and so even in the last, in the slide just before, where there are like big clusters, there is no yes, yeah, they are they are big clusters because uh, almost all of them, most of their relationships, and especially their strongest relationships, are within uh, nodes on that cluster. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that they are close together. No, 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 yeah. no. Because, for instance, uh, one of these, I'm not sure which one, it's like very south of Italy, while most of the other ones are like a south of France and uh, Catalonia as well, so they are very far apart. Which is in some way quite meaningful for some of them because we have a very strong argument to say that those, those people were able to sail along the Mediterranean coast. So we have a, a, some kind of a stylistic connection between Italy and uh, uh, Catalonia with no thing in between, but it's just because they probably sent straight to the other side of the Mediterranean area. Yeah. Yeah, some of the other ones where they are geographically closer, and even if they are at the same time, they have nothing in common, while the other one is far apart, there's something in common. So, uh, when we look now at the um, for the pottery trade, what we see is like in contrast, uh, for instance here, we see no clear pattern of the distribution of the top ranking. Here we do see that most of the top sites, they all fall within the same particular group, which in this case is actually, uh, it's a group that belongs most of the sites to a time period two. So we have time period one, two, and three, and they do all tend to fall in the same. But uh, when we look at our graph centrality, again, we see that Despite most of them falling on the same cluster group, there is no dominance of the structure of the network by uh, any of them. Uh, now, again, because we have a good radio carbon, we divided our, uh, our data set in three time periods of the early Neolithic, and then we composed the uh, networks for consecutive periods. So we have a network with the uh, sites from the time period one and two, and another one with time period two and three. Uh, so we can study if the, the relationships between these occupations, how we change and the structure of the network, change through time. When we look at our um, personal ornaments, what we see is, again, most of the features that we saw in the, on the full network, that we see no clear pattern or clear structure, no clusters forming, 
and we see that uh, each uh, site, in respective of their uh, cultural uh, background, they do tend to form relationships with others, again, irrespective of their uh, cultural background. And what we also see is very interesting. We, we have uh, the, the mean level of similarity between the occupation, the, the assemblies of each occupation, it lowered in the later periods versus that of the first periods, which means that there was an increase in the diversity of the beat types in the later periods versus those of the early periods. When we look at the pottery, again, in contrast, we have uh, very structured uh, networks, and uh, this uh, structure even increases further in the later periods. Uh, we actually only have, uh, between the two B clusters, we only have one link linking the two, the two sides of the network. And uh, we also have an increase in the mean level of uh, similarity between uh, the assemblages in the later periods. In this case, uh, meaning that there was an increase in similarity in the later period, uh, which reflects a decrease in the level of diversity observed for the pottery trades in the later period. So uh, what would be for me interesting, uh, coming from uh, the AI side, it would be to model uh, the relationships between the different populations. As I explained in my uh, first network, that we have the relationships that sometimes you have positive relationships, negative relationships, or competition or uh, mutualism where they both work on the same way. To try to study how the, the, these relationships between the different occupations, how the kind of relationships that they had, because then it would uh, allow us also to explore the different routes of transmission, because sometimes we might find uh, a same trait across the big geographical landscape and uh, also across time, how these uh, uh, ideas were transmitted through, through the different population, and, and explore also how uh, different uh, mechanisms of transmission that we see for pottery and uh, personal ornaments, how, uh, how this is expressed uh, uh, and how they, if their roots of transmission, was they, uh, were they different or not, if you have uh, point A and point B, if they have uh, the same trait for uh, pottery and uh, ornaments, did they both took the same route or they took different routes or not? So maybe using some model approach uh, based on the relationships and uh, topography and the uh, ecological niche that different populations and uh, uh, cultures occupy, if we could model the routes of transmission of these mechanisms and see how their transmission affected their roots. Then that's it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, in your introduction, you were saying that ornaments are basically um, better to look into cultural dynamics, but basically what you're showing with your results is the absolute opposite is that functional tool would appear to be more um, instructive. Yeah, this is something I discussed with uh, Solange the other day because, you know, you the the study of uh, pottery has been done way earlier than uh, ornaments, so yeah. all the classifications for archaeological cultures has been based in pottery trades, not including ornaments. So what we see here is uh, we have other, other work that we've done is like a kind of a failure of the archaeological classifications to show the actual pairings and the structures that we see in the personal ornament. Okay. If we, we have uh, some algorithms that we put, they are able to create artificial groupings and they are better, the, the scores that we get are better than the scores that we get for uh, uh, using the archaeological culture attributes. And also, we are not looking at the techniques for the pottery. We are really looking at the decorations and only the decorations. Yeah, just the ge gesture, pattern, and things like that, not, yeah, not, 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 not the clay, the not, not how the different pieces of clay were, were yeah, at, 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 at um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I propose to so if, if we have uh, in our, that kind of, uh, it's called clustering, that uh, we put uh, an algorithm and it tries to create a cluster and see the relationship between the different uh, nodes to try to see which groups of partitions they belong and then give us a score of how good that uh, partition is to reflect the actual network relationship. And uh, what we see is like both of our algorithms always gives better results than the archaeological uh, cultural definitions that we have. Mm -hmm. But it's way better for pottery than ornaments. But even in, uh, for pottery, because we see most of the um, here, 
that it, it looks at the cardial and it's able to distinguish the cardial, the epicardial, and the impressive, but it's not able to distinguish the different regional expressions of the cardial. So maybe if we included other facets of the pottery trace, maybe it would be able to actually discern the different, uh, by the different colors. It's not because we only use one facet. Yeah, no, it's just, it reminded me of, uh, and it reminded me of a work of uh, Ronan Meo in 2014. Ronan Meo, who did something, who looked at the decoration on Iroquoian pottery, um, in, in a cultural transmission aspect, and he found something very similar, actually, to what you're presenting there, uh, for, for the transition between the archaic and the... The uh, art paper, John Hart. What, John Hart. A different no, 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 Ronan Meo is the, the one actually who did the thesis in okay. 2014, and John Hart, there's another story. Ah, okay. 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 Um, but uh, he basically uh, said that not only the group structure, but also the uh, pattern of postmarital um, establishment uh, was extremely influential in how uh, the decoration on the pottery um, during the transition between the uh, uh, archaic period and uh, uh, Iroquoian period, um, it could explain most of it. And it was mainly because the potters were most likely women, and women were the people actually who were shifting from place to place, actually. And they were bringing with them um, uh, the knowledge of and, and this type of decoration. Yeah, but in this case, uh, why we, they would not have not also taken with them their own fashion and personal ornament? I mean, they, they, if the people are moving, the women are moving, they are moving with their personal ornament. So why you should, I mean, what, what I see, but if, if I make a mistake, you will correct me. Is I see that on the one side, we have the homogenization, gradual homogenization of the decoration, and on the other side, we have a gradual diversification of the personal ornament. So one has to find a viable explanation for this uh, let's say process that apparently is going into different directions. So what I see is that the, in a, the human body and the way in which people are culturalizing their human body um, is submitted to a diversification, while in, a, in another element of the material culture, which is less linked with uh, your way of presenting yourself to the others, we uh, observe a gradual uh, um, homogenization. So how, we, how we present that? So I, did, I think one has to find an explanation for that uh, duality. And one is touched to um, the type of decoration of object, and the other is just uh, the way in which, for example, one possible explanation would be um, um, gradual social diversification. So perhaps the people become diversified in each of these sites, but not in the different way. So they are trying to find a way to differentiate themselves from the other. So that would be would justify uh, a gradual diversification. While apparently, in the in when when decorating pottery, they are not really interested in uh, in create uh, um, this type of because one is more functional. One is more functional. The other one is more maybe more individual yeah, to allow more, more diversity. But this is this is kind of combination of the two conclusions for the from the two first paper because in the first paper at the European scale but including Mediterranean, what we see is that the Neolithic personal ornaments, the farming personal ornaments are changing because they are mixed with the hunter gatherers personal ornaments progressively from the east to the west. So this is also what we see here because it's only the farmers' uh, personal ornaments, but in fact, it includes, the database includes the one acquired progressively from the foragers, first of all. And secondly, that, that was the, one of the conclusions with the, the first comparison with pottery and ornament, is that it's not the same kind of uh, production, it's not the same kind of uh, people involved in the production, like uh, pottery may be more a kind of a family production, small-scale production, while the personal ornaments which are really meaningful from the social point of view, they need to, to express all the social diversity within groups, really, really more than what we express pottery by family units. Here you will express like individual identities and so on. And the, the diversification, so that can be a third hypothesis. The one that I would like to discuss if I successfully combine the database with the near-eastern personal elements is that 
so the, the agriculture domestication is invented and, and it emerged in the Near East. And you have a small community of farmers that come in, into Europe. And when the farmers arrive in, in Europe, there is a kind of cultural bottleneck. And the person and the most diversity observed uh, within the Near East is totally lost when they arrive in Europe. And after that, the diversity increases again progressively for multiple reasons, social and uh, a mixture with uh, foragers. So for me, this is also what it, it's showing. Like the, the, the people who migrate uh, out of the Near East do not reflect the full population, the full Near Eastern population. Like classical uh, migration, I mean, not all the population migrate. It's only specific people for specific reasons, economic, um, traveling purpose, anything, but not all the population. So it was not all the social statues that migrate. So when the people arrive, they have to rebuild again all the social statues that they had and create new ones because they encounter foragers. So this thing, I think this is what we are starting to observe. Basically, this is coming a little bit like the paper, the preprint on the structure, basically, of the population in and cultural um, cultural change. How structure um, changes will influence structural change, uh, cultural change in the end. I think there are many links between the two. Yeah, definitely. Maybe interesting actually that we have a presentation from Eleni to then discuss the potential link between well, the talk of Daniel, the talk of Luke, and uh, on what Eleni is doing. It is pretty related, yeah. Well, perhaps at some stage it would be interesting to compare uh, how different the uh, decorations are from the more functional aspects of the pottery. So if they, do we see the same gradual homogenization that we see in the decoration in the morphology, size, volume? Of yeah, the but the thing is that the, the database does not exist because those, those, those data are really, really harder to collect at a larger geographic scale. So. Yeah. Um, because that, that would, one would explore yeah. whether the decoration and the function go in the same direction or you have a gradual homogenization only on the more decorative aspect. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, what you say, the fact that there is a sort of founder effect, so all, only part of the bead are exported with the people, and the people, when they arrive, they are recreating social variation which is expressed by more complex mm -hmm. I think it's a good explanation. I mean, it, it seems to me, it looks to me, it's a reasonable explanation. I'm less convinced by the fact that uh, the bead in some way are related with the previous Mesolithic population because the fact that there are some bead come from the Mesolithic population does not necessarily um, entail that following there would be a diversification. So I would explain the diversification more by the diversification, following the diversification of society. That the fact that there were previous uh, Mesolithic beads, because the fact that you are having some Mesolithic beads does not, I mean, with all the present there, I don't see why it should necessarily uh, produce a further diversification. Uh, you know, you arrive there, perhaps you exchange with Mesolithic, perhaps you are taking some of their beads, but why this should lead to a further diversification? It's better explained by the fact that people, when they're arriving, they will create perhaps a more complex social structure. There will be people, different social roles, which will be reflected by the. By okay. But in any case, I think is a is a fascinating, the fascinating study. Uh, after that, they say a Neolithic. We're not now talking from the space perspective of the archaeologist, archaeologist, the one that is really concentrated on his own archaeological site. And of course, each of these uh, dots represent the work of one or two or three colleagues that spend their life excavating a site. Yeah. So they, uh, each of these person will probably spend a lot of time in trying to see how their dot is related to the other dot. Uh, and looking at, you know, that, that uh, they say, you present a global pattern, but after one, of course, in the discussion, could go into the details. And yes, okay. Then we can look uh, in one of the networks. There is a, a nice pattern of more or less highly intense that they form a nice pattern all along the, mm -hmm. the coast of southern France to Catalonia, following more or less a timeline. Mm -hmm. So we can see some of those patterns, like some of those relationships are very clear, more or less how they went. Others, not so much. Yeah. 
to that interesting result. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we move on to Eleni um, and, uh, and then Tristan. I wanted to say, like, for this thing that you were discussing, that like, I'm not sure if I understood it completely, <laughs> uh, but I think it's very interesting that you're making a distinction between functional and decorative items. And, like, in what I'm going to present, like, we have, like, you know, like uh, innovation for functional, like, for improving performance, like, we, we have not really studied, like, collective, more like creativity. Like, we do have, like, a single, like, like one agent creating stuff on, on their own. What we call like uh, abandoning objective, optimization objective, and like asking things from the completion operator. But uh, not really like uh, many agents. And to me, like it, it does sound that there should be like different transitions, like in the two cases, like functional and. Functional. Well, in the present state of the work, we are mostly like trying to maximize some sort of functional reward. But I think we could easily imagine extending the model to. Uh, something which is more exploratory, where I just try to, for example, I don't know, maximize the diversity of the template form or something like this. Mm -hmm. Can I use your... Yeah, sure. You have your, the precise. Uh, yeah. Oh, we speak English. Nobody says it's Should do a kind of seminar at the lab or something. Of 
it captures the deceptive nature of uh, innovation. So you, when you start playing this, this game, you start with uh, six elements. You don't see these colors. I don't know these elements, but uh, we exclusively belong to. And then you can combine them in triads, and you can create new elements. But not all combinations will create a new element. There's actually these two trajectories that the agent cannot, that the players cannot see. And he says that if you combine orange, red, and yellow, you will get uh, purple uh, medicine, which will be also give you some rewards. Whereas if you combine three, you will get this uh, um, orange one, and you get the same reward. So at the beginning, when you start playing this game, you don't know anything, so you just randomly uh, mix elements until, by random chance, you will either go here or, or here. And then there is two properties of this game. There's uh, first, when you create a, a new element, you can you need to reuse it in the same trajectory. And second, as you go up, this is like a innovation level one, two, three, you increase your rewards. So once you go on a trajectory, you are incentivized to play an X instead of playing one together. And this would have been fine, but there is there is a trick. Like when you reach the third level uh, on one trajectory, you need to combine it with an element from the other trajectory. And this is what makes the task deceptive, because in order to achieve no. and when you do this, you get a very high reward. Uh, and yeah, the task is deceptive because to find this optimal solution, um, so the optimal solution in the long term, you need to act suboptimally in the long term. You need to instead of progressing on the one path, go back. And now in this experiment, um, there wasn't just one human, there was many humans that were solving the task together, and they could see what the other was doing, and they could copy them. And this study studied um, uh, two types of topologies. We have the fully connected topology and the partially connected <coughs> topology. In the fully, they divided uh, uh, <laughs> into groups of six. And in the fully connected, they all see each other. In the partially connected, they're divided into three subgroups. And then once in a while, one, one human goes to the other group, and then at some point, they return. And uh, what they showed was quite interesting. They showed that. The fully connected uh, structure at the beginning performs very well, but then it flattens out while the dynamic the partially connected one uh, at, the, at the beginning is not so good, but then it, it, uh, it finds the optimal solution. And what happened here is that um, in the fully connected uh, groups, one, like they, they all start randomly mixing stuff, and once someone finds uh, the right one, then they all copy, so copy them. And so they also progress on the trajectory, whereas in the, um, in the partially connected, like one of the clusters will find one solution, the other of the clusters will find another solution, they will progress on both paths, and then at the end they will, they will, they will be able to mix the discovery. And in reinforcement learning, we have also used experience sharing. So Clement so the general reinforcement learning aids and environment interaction, but here you will see it more precisely in this. Uh, imagining that the reinforcement learning agent is playing um, this uh, void task. So the environment is the uh, task. It tells you which elements you start with, how you can combine them, what rewards you will get. And the agent is interacting with the environment um, consecutively. And the interaction consists of two steps. The first step, it is an action, and the action is which element you want to combine. And then the environment returns to you with a reward and a new element if, if, that, if that action was like a valid combination. And the agent has uh, two important components. It has its policy, which is a mapping from uh, the observation from, from its current condition to which action it should take that tells you um, which action will give you the maximum reward if you're in this condition. And this is the objective of reinforcement learning, to learn this policy. And then there is a memory, which is nothing fancy. Human memory is just a, a bucket, a buffer of uh, your past experiences. But it's very important in deep reinforcement learning because it helps you reuse your past knowledge. And of course, you are in a, in a multi agent, you have multiple uh, agents that each act in their own copies of the environment and they each use their own policy, they're deciding independently, but they do affect each other through experience sharing. So by experience sharing, we mean that you take one uh, element from your memory and you put it in the memory of the other, it's, it's forced, there's no like, there's no normative characteristics. Yeah. And this experience is the form of which action you took when you're in a certain condition and what rewards and motivates you both. Um, and, yeah. and in um, 
Experience sharing has been studied in reinforcement learning in a field called distributed reinforcement learning, which is very active today because uh, by having multiple agents that are acting in, in their own cognitive environment, you can parallelize them and you can run them in different machines, and that makes uh, training way, way quicker. Um, so uh, most of the reinforcement learning algorithms, although you say it's an H1 algorithm, like it consists of uh, uh, multiple agents nowadays. And the most common uh, structure they choose to connect the agents is a star topology, which results in a fully connected um, topology, where you have some agents like collecting information, giving it to a central node. The central node does some computation, and then it sends it up. And so the potential of the um, effect of like, di different types of social network structures has not really been investigated because there is the assumption that uh, the more you share, the better. So now we will describe our own uh, computational study with deep RL agents that solve a collective uh, innovation task. Uh, we have introduced a learning framework that we call Sapiens. And this is a type of the distributed reinforcement learning framework where there is a social network structure that describes who shares experiences with whom. Uh, so in, in this present study, we have tried out four, uh, four topologies or social network structures. We have a fully connected ring, a small board in the dynamic, where just with some probability, we just fit some edges around um, uh, the agents. And then we also <coughs> compare to some other baselines that are not sapiens. There are the two distributed RL algorithms that are the fully connected topology, and we have a single agent, and we have two ten agents that are not sharing any experiences. So this is to disentangle the effect of having many agents and having agents that are sharing experiences. Um, we studied, uh, we used the reinforcement learning testbed that is called Warcraft. It just has been introduced recently. It looks very similar to the um, uh, Boyd. Uh, that's what I said before. Uh, and it is inspired from legal alchemy, if you know it. You start with some elements. Here you start with uh, earth and water. And it, you combine them, and then you make a new element. You get a reward. You can use the new element with other elements. And, uh, but uh, we didn't use the words in our, in, our, in our case. We designed our own abstract task. Uh, and we designed three different tasks that uh, were aiming at capturing different challenges when you're solving. Uh, when you're innovating. Uh, the first one is a single path test where uh, you start with three elements, uh, A1, A2, and A3. And then if you combine the A1 and A2, you get a new one. Then you need to reuse the newly created one with the other uh, initial element. And, and basically, you can just progress, progress on a single innovation path. Uh, this, this, this can be used to, to model like, the evolution of uh, a, a single, like a uh, uh, thing like the evolution of the form from 2 to 3 to 14. And from an optimization objective, it's a uh, perspective. It's a uh, very easy task because there is one global optimum. It just makes it easy. You only have one option to maximize your rewards. Uh, then we tried the merging path task, which is inspired from the void. It's the same actually. You have like the two trajectories. You can continue straight on to path A, which will give you some rewards and it's the first local optimum. You can continue to pass B and then you get the same reward and it's the second local optimum. And the global of the best solution is to go to A1, A2, B1, B2, and then combine them to go on the path C. And this is this is a difficult task actually because you need to avoid first this local optimum, then you need to avoid then this local optimum and then and and then you need, and then you can find the global optimum. Um, and then we have the best of ten path task, which basically you have ten copies of the single path, and they all they're all equally rewarding, but one of them is more rewarding than the others, and you have to find which one. Um, so this is nine local optima if you go to any of the non uh, optimal trajectories, and the path B is the optimal one. And these local optima are easier to avoid. So the main challenge here is to explore the large search space. So you have to explore them all before you know which one is the best. And in terms of like results, we we evaluated the methods I, I mentioned before on the three tasks, and we saw that uh, there is quite a few differences between structures and also between social network structures and between tasks. So uh, we we measure group.
to success, which is the, the probability that the athlete and agent in the group will find the optimal solution. And the time to first success, which is the time that during training that this happens. So basically, it's the uh, performance and the conversion rate. And we see that in a single pass task, everyone uh, found the optimal solution, which is not surprising. But uh, what uh, was a bit surprising is that uh, experience sharing, so yeah, the um, dynamic small words being in full connected, they do not outcompete the, the structures that do not share information. And uh, actually, the, the, the full connected is the slowest one compared to the others. And then in the merging uh, path, uh, that we have uh, the dynamic uh, performing better than everything else except for the notes, the conditions of multiple experiences. Uh, and we see that the fully connected ones, which are the fully connected ACC and APEX, they all perform really, really bad. They, they find nothing. And the best of them, but uh, we have a dynamic theory of competing all the others. It means that it explores the space more quickly. And uh, these are uh, these are interesting observations, but we cannot, this not help us explain why different structures perform differently in different tasks. And usually in reinforcement learning, you just measure rewards. Uh, but in this study, we found that introducing additional metrics to characterize the behavior and the memory of the agents in the group is, is useful for understanding why they behave this, the, the way they behave. So the behavioral metrics were inspired from um, psychology studies. Uh, we have conformity, which is the percentage of agents in a single group that at the end of the trajectory ended up in the same element. And this is lower for the no sharing conditions because uh, sharing experiences makes you like more similar to the others. And volatility is the number of time steps during training, no, number of times during training that you change your mind, you change the policy you were following compared to, to the past. And here we see that fully connected, this, this is in a single pass test. Here we see that uh, fully connected has higher volatility than the others, which is indicative that uh, this can learn to learning instability. And then we have the mnemonic matrix, which is we look at the memory of the agent and we, we, we count how many unique elements they have in their memory. We do this for an individual, so we look at the memory, many elements, and then we average within the group. And this is the group diversity. We collect all the memories of the group in a single group memory, and we, we compute this diversity. And we say that fully connected has the highest uh, diversity in terms of individuals, and it has the lowest uh, diversity in terms of uh, uh, groups. And it means that when you're extensively sharing experiences with others, that increases your own experiences, but it also makes the group more homogeneous. Uh, so to conclude this study, uh, we like with this empirical study we reproduced some results from a human studies which said that partially connected dynamic structures are better at solving innovation tasks. We also introduced additional structures and additional tasks so we can offer uh, testable, can offer concrete hypotheses to future human studies. And we have shown that um, with uh, deep reinforcement learning agents, you can measure properties like the, the their memory, which is actually hard to, to do with uh, humans. And in terms of limitations, uh, it's, uh, the tasks that we try are very simple for reinforcement learning people. And we, that was on purpose to make sure that uh, we get a clear conclusion. But in the future, we want to transfer to like more, more complex and more tasks. And then a word of caution for like people that want to use like uh, RL for the like uh, to replace your computation models. It, it does need a lot of, like, it, it, it can give you powerful insights, but it also needs a lot of computation. And I will quickly go through another project. It's, it's not directly related to this, but it may be. Um, so we studied the effects of ecological dynamics on the evolution of uh, adaptation mechanisms um, and species diversity. And there uh, we found uh, studies from human behavior ecology, actually the ones that uh, Clément mentioned about what happened in, in East Africa about five million years ago, where there was a um, uh, large environmental complexity that uh, led to the um, diversification and specific and speciation of the species that were living in that area. 
And also, like, if we look at the, our current world, like, there's, like, there's a huge diversity of species, but there's also a huge diversity of ecological conditions. And we categorize them as, like, space and temporal diversity in time and in on multiple time scales, and spatial diversity in the, in the, in the form of niches. And so we, we wanted to make, like, a, to capture, like, the real world properties, but also have, like, a very simple model. So we came, came up with this very abstract model where you have, like, a, you have a number of niches and you have a single climate function which evolves in the same way in its niche, but it has a vertical offset. So that, uh, as, as you change the latitude of the niche, you go to niches with, like, higher climate, and the climate directly determines the state of the niche, and it also determines its capacity. Higher, higher climate values of higher capacity. And we employed uh, a population of agents that were adapting their plasticity and their evolvability using evolutionary. Uh, using, um, well, we, we tried two selection mechanisms. We tried to select uh, survival of the fittest. And we also tried niche limited competition with survival of the fittest. And we saw, uh, so I, I, I don't know, uh, I don't want to go into more details of the model. Uh, but just to, to show how we use it, we, we have to have these poles where the their rectangles are different niches and their 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 opacity shows their um, capacity in terms of how, how many agents can fit. And we have this climate function and when this changes we also change the capacity uh, of the world and the population is trying to, to survive in there and it goes to different niches. And we monitor Robert did the specificity, the vulnerability, and the diversity. And we see that there is a complex interplay between the climate function you use, the selection mechanism you use, and the, also the number of species. Um, and then how is this related to um, the sapiens thing I mentioned before? Um, one can imagine that this, this ecological dynamics of variability and, and having multiple species, they can create ecological barriers that are enforcing a, a certain social network structure in the population. So when the barrier appears, that you, you are isolated in your cluster, when it can be desert, it can be mountain, it can be too thick. And so we can imagine like very series of sapiens where instead of uh, designing, the, 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 the designing but determining different types of social network structures ourselves, we let the structure emerge from uh, the ecological dynamics of the site. Uh, <clears throat> just a, a question with regard to uh, the first model where you're um, uh, took looking at some memory. Mm -hmm. um, like, what were the, the. Can you explain to us, like, your memory was it fixed accumulating? Accumulating with time? Mm -hmm. Or um, was there any possibility actually for. If you do not use such and such recipe, you will lose it, and you will have to spend more time relearning it. So, some type of loss of, in memory, and how does that affect actually the? Uh, the well, the memory is yeah. It starts with you start with no memory, then you start collecting data, and you start learning after you collect like a minimum amount of data, and then you just accumulate it, and then there, it's like a first in first out. Like if you overflow, you lose it. But okay. you don't you don't lose it based on your performance. Okay. Uh, you you may lose your policy based on you may forget like you start discovering like other 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 areas of the search space and then you poly you update your policy and then you forget about some some uh, some maybe you forget about going to the other trajectory. But there's actually like in enforcement learning there's uh, ways of prioritizing your experiences based on your performance. That you can put like higher ways to experiences that gave you more uh, rewards. Okay. Do you think it would be possible to make this model, but saying, okay, um, every hundred steps, whatever you have not used before those hundred steps are deleted. You no longer have this memory. Mm -hmm. And how does that how does that affect actually mm -hmm. the 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 cultural pattern, the cultural change pattern you're seeing? Uh, do you think it would be pertinent to do that, or? Yeah. So this sort of like, if it's a hundred times steps, 
Okay. I don't know, I'm just saying a hundred like that. We, we did try the thing I mentioned before, the prioritizing. So if you if you haven't used an, an experience recently, or if you use an experience and it doesn't give you any information, then you put it in low priority, so it's kind of equivalent to forgetting it. And then we saw that, for example, in, the, in, this, in this case, uh, because it has multiple agents <coughs> exchanging their experiences, and what is not important for you may, may not may be important for the other, and also like what is important for you may not be important for the other. So if you try to compute this sort of priority in an agent, and then send it to another agent, and the other agent does not recompute it, then things will go very wrong. What you presented in the, the, the last uh, the last uh, trial, the, the glance of the research, um, in fact, is is, uh, is the conclusion to which uh, most uh, research now on the origin of modern human in Africa are reaching. So the fact that in fact there are structured population, but the, the structure, so the relationship between these population, uh, open and close. Uh, as a result of climate change. So we have to envision mm -hmm. a, uh, a, a process, a scenario um, of a connection, which are genetic connection and also exchange of cultural traits, trait, and moments in which there was no this connection. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulties, so, so we, in fact, we know that it happened like that. Now the question is what kind of data we can use to feed the, the process to see what were the consequences of each of these um, climatic and environmental change to the, to the, the scenario. Mm -hmm. and, and if we read the paper, if you read the paper, the one that I put on, on nature, with uh, try to make a synthesis of the present, they, they explain that quite clearly. Um, so if there was, a, let's say, um, an input from uh, the modeling uh, on that, to try to find what would be the more reliable scenario, considering all the variables that we may know, for example, use on, uh, there are um, attempts to uh, provide uh, spatial climate or vegetation modeling over the last 300,000 years in Africa, in which we see, for example, the attempt done by Manica, in which he, he gives a um, um, set of uh, climate model. Uh, and try to use this to feed the, the type of the modeling that, that model that you presented, that may produce an, a, a scenario of how things uh, become come to into contact and close and open over the last three hundred thousand years. So let's say I, I see this as a very promising way, particularly one is able to put more data into it. Yeah, this, I think it is very interesting. Do you think that, that in order to answer the questions we currently have about human evolution, mm -hmm. like in the past, like 80 million of years ago, do we need like more data, or do we need more theory, or do we need more models? The um, certainly, there would be it would be better if we can constrain more of these um, um, these models, constrain with uh, potential population size and carrying capacity in different types of environments. Uh, and see how things may change in different regions of Africa. Because after the region of Africa does not necessarily respond, as we mentioned before, in the same way to the same climate change. So in one case, perhaps you can have uh, an increase in population. In another area, it would be a decrease in population. And in some moment, you would have uh, uh, you know, the Sahara, which in fact would become uh, an area that favors connection between people. In another moment, it would be become a divide between the north and the south. But this it can be, I mean, I think it's, it's possible. Um, you, there are you know, three, four papers that I think would be interesting. You know, Sherry, Eleanor Sherry papers, and there are two or three papers that try to model that. The Green Sahara hypothesis of connection between the north and the south. What is interesting about this type of dynamics is that it seems that it is relevant both for biological evolution. Uh, so like typically this uh, Africa story with the Sahara barrier, etc. 
Uh, and also the um, graphs you showed in your talk when you see that basically many uh, omin species cohabited together and were probably mixed actually. Uh, and also in terms of cultural evolution, as Eleni showed uh, so in the talk of Daniel and Luke, for different groups uh, that are isolated and then can connect, how they can boost innovation. The, the three things now uh, seem to go, uh, if one accepts the sort of multi region, regional um, or regional model in Africa, things seem to go well together. Because anatomically, you see in each region some new character coming out, but not all the characters, the same character in different regions. So it's sort of long process of oppression and, and unification of modern trade between 300,000 and 100,000. Culturally, you see basically the same. Some, some region in which there are no real innovation. But in some cases, perhaps there was not enough excavation. But in some cases, we, we and, and other cases in which you have uh, innovations that are not the same than those produced in a different region, which also go into the direction of different basin of people uh, connecting or not connecting to each other. And from a genetic point of view, um, uh, as well, because you know now we have proof of integration of archaic gene into modern human genome in Africa. So these people were not just uh, coming out, but there was an uh, interaction with the previous population. Um, uh, although there are some papers that to still continue to think of a single origin and you know, link to the southern Africa, so it's not that clear. Um, but um, um, I think almost everybody thinks that the idea of uh, structural population is the right one. But in the end, they say, okay, but there are so many variables and so many stuff that happened in the last 300,000 years that, in fact, we, we cannot really create a scenario, a step-by-step -step scenario what happened. This is why you're relying on data is maybe not so much important. Well, at least from a computer scientist perspective, it is not that much important. What is maybe more feasible, at least, is to um, well, like to highlight some mechanism that could have played a role. Maybe it's like in this type of experiment where we don't know if this type of type structure or social network structure are extremely relevant from a uh, human evolution perspective. But at least we show that it has some effect uh, on some mechanisms, and that yeah. is already, I think, useful. Yeah, yeah. They say um, it depends on whether one can restruct, uh, construct uh, the mechanism of the process. Mm. If you want to reconstruct the process, which is often what people want to know, is uh, it would be nice to see what happened, when, when things happen, and where. Yeah. yeah. But another context or kind of uh, similar application would be the middle poetic upper poetic transition in Europe because now we have more or less the same uh, idea with different uh, arrivals of population from not from Europe and uh, modern humans and when they arrive uh, they have their own background but the very first uh, arrival they are short in time uh, like they, they, we have some some evidence that they were there but but Finally, we don't know how they last, and after they are, and, and for, for some time, they are the Neanderthal guy on the territory. And after that, the second wave of, of new minds with new cultural background, and very, very early, we see similarity between uh, Bulgaria and uh, uh, west of France uh, at the very first phase of uh, Homo sapiens arrival in Europe, and so we have like different patch everywhere in Europe. And we observe that there is some kind of statistic and cultural connections, but it's uh, the result of a very short time, small demographic wave of people that arrive and arrive and arrive like that. So, if, if you believe in Mandra, ah, I was believing in Bacho <laughs> They say sometimes uh, the scenario, the middle apocalyptic transition, are uh, based on uh, discovering single sites. And so if you accept the evidence in one side, you would create a scenario which is different that you do not accept. For example, there was a, a study in the site in the, in the south of France in which it was proposed that modern humans were there you know, a few thousand years before ever people would you know, call it, would believe that they were there. Some people believe it, some people don't, because in the end of just one or two pieces, uh, 
Uh, some people say you cannot say modern human because the tooth is broken. And but I was really thinking about which database that we have to, to put in a model. And in fact, we have the ornament database still for this period. And that, that database, so Mandrin is not fixed, but anyway, everybody is not, does not agree uh, with that. So, but we have all the transitional sites, all the first origination yeah, sites, and all the, the late origination sites. Uh, the Chateau Peroni, and some people think it's made by Neanderthal, some other think it's not. The Luzian, some people think it's made by Neanderthal, mm -hmm. some other think it's made by modern human. So when you try after to, to, um, to create a scenario, you have to take a stand on one side or another, which is, at present, is not easy. Why? I mean, in Africa, it's a more, uh, it's a more open question. Uh, there is less data, but potentially, I mean, yeah. The, the other thing is like also if we're looking if we want to include the environment complexity for example like okay for <clears throat> indeed for the period you're talking about we do have a pretty clear <clears throat> idea of what was the environment and the models we have are, pretty, are fairly ac well not accurate but fairly precise huh? but we also have for example like all Binford's um, uh, constricting uh, frames of references which is Basically, it looks for different environments, what type of social structure they have, and so on. And perhaps we can extract uh, some um, social variable to feed these different models depending on, on environmental data, which then afterwards allow us to perhaps investigate more. Okay, given fluctuations we know in the environment, potential environments that should have been available and let's say population that are dispersed in these environments, how do cultural innovation and cultural change occur? Perhaps this could be also a way to go more on the theoretical part while grounding ourselves in both archaeology and what we know from ethnology as well. Um, could be a first step that could also lead to a um, uh, conclusion that might help us actually uh, look at the archaeological in a different way, given all the biases that historically have been accumulated with the archaeological data. And you think there is an access to that databases with enough information about structure and climate? Co construction um, frames of reference is this video from Lewis Binford, published in two, early 2000. Um, but there's also the database that is um, that is um, attached to it, and I think it comes in. A, I'm pretty sure I, ha I have it somewhere. Yeah, so, but I've seen papers that with the hypothesis stating, like about the Sahara thing, for example. But not that I looked at that. But I haven't seen papers that have like this sort of statistical and correlation, and maybe causation analysis of like climate and structure and technology. It's basically a synthesis of all the work he did from 1960s with population from northern Canada, Alaska, um, in Australia, Africa as well. So there's a lot of data actually. No, no, so, I mean, try to look for the, for the paper and database by Manika who gave uh, uh, um, a spatial uh, um, climatic model uh, for Africa, uh, or so you can have uh, 10,000, 20,000 models, vegetable model and uh, temperature, etc. Okay. It's helpful to see the, the scenario. Mm. Yeah, it would be good if we share some papers uh, <laughs> by email or so. I think we we'll move to a written presentation because we are quite late. And, uh, so I might have, uh, Apologies to everyone, yeah, the time has gone. Thanks for the presentation. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, this time you are still here? Yes, I am. Okay, sorry, we are extremely late, but uh, yeah. the floor is here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. Uh, can you see my screen? 
Yes. Okay. Um, tak. But you can't see my face. Um, can't see your face. Now you can okay. see my face. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'll try to be quick uh, since we are running kind of late. Uh, so yeah. So um, we are. I, okay. I think I have some some echo, uh, but yeah. No echo here. Okay. Yeah. It's strange because I I can hear myself a bit. Uh, wait a second. Yeah, I think uh, it's the mic of participant appel, which is. We need to get the mic of participant Daniel. You can move in a dose. Okay, now it's better. But then I can I cannot hear you anymore. Uh, anyway. So yeah, just uh, some context. So yeah, um, so my talk is going to be uh, on the op open-ended skill acquisition problem that Clément uh, talked about earlier this afternoon. Uh, and if you remember, he said that uh, this uh, acquisition of skills, open-ended one, uh, relies on many, uh, mainly two mechanisms, which are uh, intrinsic motivations and uh, social and cultural interaction. So basically in this talk, uh, I'm gonna show you how we can implement uh, curious robot that relies both on intrinsic motivation and social interaction. And then oh. I'm going to start, yep. We are seeing the slide, special thanks. I'm wondering yeah, if you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. I'm just giving some context. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, yeah, okay yeah, yeah. my bad. Sorry, sorry. But then just, so the, the, the message is that we are going to start from intrinsic motivations and, and go uh, towards social interactions and give an example of an algorithm that allows to, to implement a social robot that is somehow curious. So my motivations are kind of the same as Clément. You already saw this slide uh, earlier this afternoon. But basically, we draw inspiration from uh, ch children that are uh, very uh, good at exploring their environment uh, without being externally told to do so. So they are relying on uh, intrinsic motivation, which is a fancy term to name uh, what we call in everyday language uh, curiosity. And uh, throughout their development, the, these children, they become adult and they target goals do, uh, that are more and more complex and that are expressed in different modalities. So we are going to see how uh, we can develop robots, artificial agents that are doing exactly the same. So um, for that, we start from the, sorry, from the uh, classical reinforcement in, uh, learning loop that you already saw twice, I think this afternoon. Uh, so basically, uh, it's an agent that interacts in, inside an environment, is uh, perceiving states and uh, making actions. And uh, in the classical reinforcement learning loop, there is an experimenter which is outside of this loop and is uh, giving a goal, so may basically a purpose to the agent and rewards that correspond to this goal in order to guide the agents towards the fulfillment of this goal. Um, so this is that is not autonomous because we have an external experimenter. So uh, in order to build autonomous agents that are intrinsically motivated, we remove this experimenter and we put the goals and the rewards inside the agent head. And we um, and this results in uh, autotelic agents, basically an agent that learn to represent, generate, pursue, and master uh, it, its own goals. And the meta objective of uh, this uh, agent is to learn as many goals as possible inside an environment. So basically to grow what we call an open ended repertoire of skills. So this is the theory. Now, how can we implement uh, such agents? Uh, we basically rely on four mechanisms. So first, uh, the agent is going to observe a context inside its environment. So basically perceive a, a state. And from these states, it's going to sample a goal. So basically, uh, for instance, a target inside an environment, like uh, an objective state. 
then it's going to use the policy he learned through reinforcement learning to try to achieve this goal. It's going to use his goal condition policy. Sometimes it might succeed at achieving this goal, but some, sometimes it might fail. But the agent needs to know how well he performed. So for that, it's going to use a goal condition reward function that is basically going to compute scores uh, from the goal he targeted and the states he observed. And then depending on uh, the collected experience and the scores he computed, he's going to update all these three modules and loop again. And this way, it's going to be able to master uh, a repertoire of different goals. So this uh, framework was successfully applied uh, inside the reinforcement learning uh, literature to, to build curious robots. <laughs> so basically, uh, robots like this uh, that uh, is uh, able to manipulate blocks, for instance, on a, on a plane, uh, on the plan, sorry. But uh, one drawback of this curious robot is that they are not so curious, <laughs> uh, especially they are not really creative. Um, uh, and this is mainly due to the fact that they use goals that are in fact uh, states in the environment. So basically, I, I gave an, an example here, which is basically uh, the goal is to make this this uh, pile of, of blocks. And it, it is expressed as a series of uh, position and type of cubes. But it's, it's, it's basically states and it's really hard to be creative in, in, in this domain. So the curious robot that this framework is implementing lack creativity in the sense that they will always yield goals that are within the distribution of uh, what the uh, robot uh, already uh, discovered. So how can we come up with a, a mechanism that allows to be creative when we are a robot? <laughs> Uh, again, we can draw inspiration uh, uh, from children that uh, use uh, language to uh, to imagine goals during play. Uh, so this is something that uh, Jean Piaget first uh, discovered that children were using language and speech to narrate their ongoing uh, activities. And then later uh, Vygotsky showed that this egocentric speech was in fact an internalization of social interactions that the children were using to uh, to make new plans for exploration. And then if you look at language, it, 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 it's, it has a, a main property, which is kind of cool. It is that it's compositional by nature and it allows to uh, create new uh, innovations <laughs> just by recombining known structures. So uh, this is how you can come up with the famous uh, sentence by Noam Chomsky, colorless green ideas lead for your sleep. So then if we start from this observation, how can we use that inside our autotelic agents to make them more creative? So this is basically what we investigated in our imaging agent, which is an autotelic agent that has mainly two learning phases. Uh, a first one where the agent is going to learn to represent abstract goals using language, basically by interacting with the social partner. So this can be considered as a language acquisition phase. And then there is going to be an, a second phase, uh, which is kind of equivalent to uh, the internalization that Vygotsky was speaking about, where the agent will no longer interact with a social partner, but basically use its knowledge about language to create new plans and create new goals. So then let's try to to build these agents with the, the autotonic framework that I, I showed you uh, before. So now we are in a special case because we have a new protagonist in the story, which is the social partner. So um, <clears throat> here you remember in the classical reinforcement learning, uh, loop we used to have an experimenter, but I replaced it by a social partner. And what what's the job of the social partner is to give description to the agent so that it can build its internal goals and rewards in order to uh, full uh, discover interactions, interesting interactions in the environment. So basically, the the important thing to notice from this slide is that this, there is a social partner which is giving descriptions, so lingu li linguistic descriptions about what's 
interesting to do in environment when, when the agent is doing something cool the, the social partner will basically say okay this is cool and you should be uh, focusing on that so to conduct uh, our experiments we used uh, a, a really basic environment which we call the playground so it's basically a 2d uh, continuous world uh, which contains a variety of objects, so uh, animals, plants, furniture. And these objects have compositional dynamics. For instance, I can make this fly grow if I'm bringing it food to it, or if I'm putting the fly on the food. Uh, interestingly, the objects have different dynamics. Uh, for instance, uh, plants cannot grow if I bring them uh, some food. They can only grow if I, I bring them uh, water. And what you see in this environment is that, for instance, at the end of this episode, okay, the bush grow. So then the social partner is giving description of, of, of what the, uh, the agents did. So now that you know everything about the environment uh, and the social partner, let's uh, deep dive into the details of the agents. So if you remember in autotelic learning, we have three uh, main components of the agents. Uh, first, the agent needs to uh, generate goal. So for that, we use a simple mechanism where uh, the agent is going to memorize what uh, the social partner uh, said, and it's going to build a repertoire of goals that are basically the description he received. And at the very beginning, when he wants to start doing something, he's, he's basically going to sample inside this memory to target a goal for exploration. So this is the first step, uh, choosing a goal. Then the agent needs to have a goal achievement uh, function to know uh, when he reached this goal or not. So for that, it's going basically to uh, construct a data set made of the observation he, he made when he received the description to associate a line the observation with the description provided the, with the, by the social partner to actually know when the the description is is fulfilled. So this is called grounding the description of of, of the social partner into the uh, agent's observation. So this is how meaning is constructed. Basically, uh, this is how the agent knows the meaning of of a sentence by looking at what it means in the observation space inside the environment. And then it needs to have the final thing, which is the policy to know, to actually be able to um, produce the sequence of actions that is going to bring him towards the goal he's, he's uh, targeting. And this is trained via standard reinforcement learning. I'm not going into these details because it's not uh, really important. So following these procedures, uh, the agent can learn a repertoire of skills, which is not so open-ended because it's, it's basically going to contain all the goals provided by the social partner. So uh, if, if, if it interacts a lot of time in, in the environment, then it, it will, end up doing something interesting. So the social partner is going to notify it and then looping over again, it's going to discover all what the social partner is able to, 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 to talk about. But then it's not open-ended. So how can we extend this uh, repertoire of skills? This is why we have this second phase where the agent is no longer interacting with the, uh, the uh, social partner but is building its own goals from the goals he discovered with the social partner. So for that, we use a simple uh, heuristic, which is based on the construction grammar. Uh, so basically it's uh, about finding uh, like a structure inside the grammar uh, that the, the, the social partner is using in order to ex extract what is a predicate, what is a, uh, um, an object and, and what is an attribute and basically categorize, categorizing these, uh, these uh, words, uh, recombining them to, to invent new, new goals. 
So for instance, in this slide, if, if the social partner told the agent how to grasp a red tree, grasp a red cat and grow a green cat, the agent can come up with a new goal, which is grow green tree that was never communicated by the agent, uh, by the social partner, sorry. So yeah, the, the basic challenges uh, that uh, the, the construction grammar framework is, is solving is the fact that uh, the constructs that we are uh, making uh, have uh, are actually uh, have a meaning. The, they are not uh, absurd like uh, repeated words or uh, or uh, instances like a red grass tree where the order of, of word is, is completely wrong. And then there is another challenge when we invent goals is that uh, the goals that we invent, even if they are grammatically correct, uh, they need to be uh, achievable inside the environment. And for that, uh, we use the reward function that we uh, we train do, uh, in the first phase to make sure that the, uh, the agent actually uh, can check uh, whether the new construct is achievable or not. And what we observed <laughs> is that uh, this uh, small mechanism uh, allows the agent to uh, augment its repertoire of skills. So this is uh, basically the curve that you see here. Um, so when the agent is never exploring, it's mastering approximately half of the goals that we can imagine in, in our environment. And when it starts imagining goals using a heuristic, it is able to achieve almost 80% of all the goals possible in, in Playground. So in inside this uh, interaction, um, we have what we call a behavioral adaptation. Uh, it's simply the fact that uh, during training, the social partner uh, is never speaking about growing plants. It's only uh, speaking about uh, uh, food, uh, sorry, about animals. And, um, and basically what we observe in, in our experiments is that uh, the agent uh, first tries to imagine goal which are uh, growing plants. And for that at the very beginning, because it only learned to grow animals, it's going to try to bring either food or uh, water to a plan to make it grow. But then as it will experience this, these uh, interactions, he will notice that when he brings food to a plant, it's not growing. So then it's going to correct his behavior and only bring uh, water to uh, the plant to make them grow. So yeah, that's basically it about the, the implementation. Uh, it has several limitations. Uh, first, uh, it's about uh, the language that the social partner is using when interacting with the agent. It's very uh, basic and sim sim uh, not natural at all. Uh, also, some limitation about imagination, which is not grounded. And another uh, drawback is that imagination imagination is limited to achievable goal. Um, so some perspective uh, that started from this work is uh, the fact that uh, this work is showing that language al allows to support uh, two dimensions, uh, which is creativity and imagination. But in fact, if you look at the literature at uh, psychology, for instance, um, there are studies showing that language has a really broad influence on uh, cognition and on, on our development. And we like to think that uh, this kind of uh, of uh, functions could be really uh, added to agents. And uh, for that, we believe that agents should uh, be embedded in rich social cultural world. So basically, in this talk, I've, I've I mainly talked about uh, so I, uh, the classic reinforcement learning loop, and then the autotonic reinforcement learning loop. And I then presented imagined which belong to this uh, last category of agents. But in imagines the social uh, the social interactions are really basic, and the agent is 
leveraging a simple mechanism to invent in, in its own goal. And we can imagine that if we embed um, agents in, uh, into rich socio-cultural worlds, they could uh, leverage the, the cultural uh, aspects present in, in the world to refine even better uh, tools for, uh, for their development. So yeah, that's basically it for my talk. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to, to answer them. Any questions for the town? Maybe just a, a remark on uh, how we think this type of mechanism are interested related to uh, to our common topics on cultural uh, transmission and innovation. It is that this model actually illustrates, uh, I think, very well the bidirectional relationships between uh, culture and uh, learning. Because we have an agent that, on one side, is able to internal, internalize cultural knowledge from the social partner. And then, having internalized this, this cultural knowledge, it is able to uh, imagine new goals that are out of the distribution of the goals that the social partner actually knows in order to uh, achieve, uh, well, to learn more skills. And so then we can imagine this in a sort of uh, infinite loop where this more skills can be transmitted to other agents that then fail will recombine them together to create even more skills, etc., etc. So we think that these type of mechanisms are uh, fundamental actually in cultural innovation. And yeah, the, I think the, the main message is that in, in the, the example I, I showed you is that the the internalization is is pretty uh, simple in the sense that uh, basically uh, the the agent is uh, extracting language structure to um, to invent new goals but language is is much more than a structure it's also the the medium for culture <laughs> Uh, and and uh, it can bring information about how the the world is is uh, is functioning, uh, and this can really be extracted for uh, for agents to to as a as a source of innovation. This is basically the the real idea from Vygotsky that. Uh, Language is not only a communicative, uh, well, it's not only here for communi communicative purposes, but it can, it is also a cognitive tool or cognitive technology that we can use uh, for different purposes, for example, for abstractions or for our imaginations or different uh, activities that are not necessarily communicative. And it formats, I assume, the agent, even in the model, it formats the agent to a certain, like, it's not only the agent is formatted by the language, but the language is formatted, no, it's the other way around. The language is not only formatted by the agent, but the agent gets formatted by the language itself. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. This is quite interesting research for the, um, like, when in innovation, like, not innovation, invention res in response to proximal um, problems. Um, so sometimes, like how, um, when faced to with a new problem, a person in prehistory will just combine pre-existing uh, elements of his cultural system or technological system to uh, address um, in a more or less positive way, actually, um, a, a problem that is arising that needs to be resolved currently. And if we put this into migration or dispersal, actually, of human, human colonizing new environments are constantly faced, actually, to with new problems that need to be resolved based on whatever cultural background, actually, these people have. So it could, like, it, it, there's a, a link I see clearly, actually, with your um, the, the, the research you presented, I mean, the two basically could definitely bring insights actually to how cultural evolution 
You mean in the sense that in both cases it's about recombining existing? Uh, yeah, in, in some way. And if we're putting it into like dispersals of population in new environments where they have absolutely no knowledge of it, how efficient um, those like dispersal or yeah, how um, not efficient, but how successful these dispersal events had to be in order to then allow for more um, members of the group actually to colonize these areas. It's, it could be... Could be something interesting uh, to extend this type of experiments, for example. So, so here in the experiment that uh, Christian presented, we have an environment that has a constant dynamics mm -hmm. with always a well, similar eating that are uh, chosen randomly, but still that are in the same distribution. Uh, and so we could imagine that uh, this environment is also subject to some temporal changes. And so over time, you have, like, for example, new items that become available or that disappear, or some dynamics of uh, combination between objects change over time. Oh, this type of good imagination mechanism could actually allow uh, this agent to quickly readapt to, to these changes. Could be something interesting. And also, we can vary the. I mean. To some extent, I'm, I'm doing a shortcut here, but uh, when we hard code the social partner, we are kind of uh, hard coding uh, social uh, pattern for in interactions. And if we extrapolate, we can say we, we <laughs> hard code the culture. And we could, we, you, we were saying that before that uh, different environments have different social uh, features. And, and this is this could be something a framework to study the impact of these different uh, uh, social features because, for instance, in 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 my experiments, the descriptions that are yielding the the goals are defined by a, a, a relevance function that the social partner. So basically, the social partner is saying. Uh, is giving description of something that he no. He, he, sorry, I have a lot of echoes, so, so I cannot speak. <laughs> yeah, well, I was saying that the the somehow when we implement the the social partner, we uh, implement a specific culture because the social partner knows what he's going to talk about, and maybe in another culture, <laughs> he will speak about something completely different, and this will give completely different agent in the end. So basically, inside the same envi environment, you could have two models of social partners and have uh, repertoires of skills that in the end are completely different. And this is something that could be interesting to, to investigate, I think. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and the like. <laughs> yeah, so this may also like relate to the question to the thing we discussed earlier today yeah, about how like the same environment actually can lead to different uh, cultural uh, trajectories. Mm. Oh, yeah. Could we reverse the... It's <laughs> <laughs> confusing. And, uh, so because if you have two kind of social partner with uh, different backgrounds and different knowledge and two different scenarios, Maybe we can, uh, in some way, uh, expect to have similar, I mean, not similar cultural trajectories, but uh, similar outcomes to see how convergence can happen when you start with very, very different, uh, yeah, skills, background, partners, and so on, because it happens uh, in our history. So maybe this is a kind of approach that can be used to try to model what, ca what are the, the, the cultural uh, uh, needs and and, uh, and 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 contour that may allow some some conversions. Yeah. Okay. So maybe just uh, one question from, from people that can um, answer this from the archaeology uh, side. Um, so one uh, kind of assumption in at least in, in this last work, is that kind of when you start using language, you kind of con con cognitively are able to achieve much more fascinating things. And this should imply that at one point, uh, you see, okay, at this point, people started using language, maybe some primitive form, maybe then later language 
became more complex. And hopefully you should see um, some changes also in culture. So when language appeared, I don't know, we started using more complex tools or something. So my question is, um, can, uh, can this even be done? Like how could you even, by looking at the archeological record, try to see, okay, maybe language was used here, maybe not. Obviously when you have writing, you can, but writing is only, <laughs> only comes later. So are people thinking about this? I assume they are, but uh, mm -hmm. what are they, uh, what are their solutions? Like how can we get, okay, maybe some primitive formal language was used here, maybe it was more complex here. And, yeah. That's for you. Did you okay. go, Francis? <laughs> or, uh... No, but I would say to think that even now linguists, many linguists accept the idea that there's not just a language, no. In fact, there was a probably closer languages yeah. of which uh, um, some linguists think that our language, in fact, has some key to uh, infer the presence of proto languages. This would be a part of the one chapter of the paper that I'm trying for the last few years to publish with, uh, to finish with Michael Albin, uh, who has a very clear idea about how our language emerged. Um, so that would be the, the, the first, uh, uh, so I said, in the archaeological record you may have uh, um, clues that may indicate that the system of communication that perhaps was not exactly equivalent to our syntactical language were there, okay? Um, otherwise, uh, um, I would explain, uh, you know, some pattern, uh, transmission, cultural transmission, etc. And then uh, say the language very similar to ours, uh, okay, and many archaeologists accept the idea that if you have uh, um, indication of uh, symbolic thinking, you must have uh, a form of language relatively developed because this uh, implies the fact that you are, uh, so in order to maintain the type of uh, symbolic behavior in symbolic material culture, you have also to transmit the meaning. Uh, if the meaning is not transmitted, then uh, one can imagine that something that is like symbolic will be lose, lost in the, so for example, things like, you know, burials, uh, uh, personal ornament, the use of pigment, uh, the fact that, for example, you are choosing some pigment but not another, a particular shade, you have to explain to somebody why you have to go, go and collect the, the pigment at a place which is 80 kilometers from your site, while perhaps a different pigment more coarse is available on one kilometer from your site. Because you are using that type of pigment to do something, perhaps during a ritual or perhaps to decorate yourself. Okay. So the old thing. now, of course, one can go into a detail and see each element of the material culture, uh, beads, the fact that you are coloring beads, for example, or, or you are hitting B to change their color. So why, why you would change the appearance of a natural? And you are, you know, when you are putting on beads um, or decorating yourself, you are changing the, the biological appearance of your body. You are transmitting to the other of your group uh, a message. But you know, in order to, if we see that this message is kept for generation and generation. One had to explain to you why you are doing that. You know, it's not just a fashion. Um, so th there are elements in the material culture, but th there is no consensus on, on this. You, uh, there are two papers that have come out recently, the presence of abstract engraving um, on the same uh, type of uh, media, um, or now engravings uh, 60,000 years ago in Austria eggshell. Um, so, um, of course, the uh, depictional representation, uh, all are these, and also an importance is given to the fact that uh, uh, these things appear as a package, not just as a single innovation, but they seem to contribute. Uh, and there is, for example, the same technique that used to heat the pigment or to heat the, um, to change the color of the pigment. Why you change it from, from yellow pigment to a red pigment? because you need the red and the fact that after the red is also applied to change the appearance of the bead. Um, so when these things uh, occur together, and you also use it to eat it with the raw material to better nap. So you have a transfer of technology 
um, which may be the result of ex cultural exaptation. So you are there in an environment in which uh, you can infer that in order to transmit all this behavior, people must have a communication system quite developed. But on the very beginning, it's not that easy to uh, to say, yeah, there was a language. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not answering your question. <laughs> but as I say, archaeology thinks that they have me to address that question. Um, but uh, as I say, we don't have the the last word on the first word. <laughs> okay. Often also in the literature on the origin of language, it's often associated with symbolic practices. But if we're looking more on a subsistent practice, one could argue, for instance, to create complex technology in order to transmit the knowledge to make this complex technology, um, some language had to be, at least some form of language, even if it's proto-language, had to be in use. And then this is pushing back quite further. For example, if we're thinking about making a birch tar, which is used to half different components of technology together, the knowledge actually to make this birch bar is quite, it, it, it requires you to select the proper bark of a specific tree, to process it in a very specific way, and all the knowledge related to this, to me, is difficult actually to be transmitted without knowledge. Huh? Right. So then it depends how, like, language, because of its close association with symbolism, archaeologists had the tendency actually to look at symbolic evidence in order to hint for a beginning of language. But if you're looking at it from a com technological complexity, which is just as valid, then you're pushing back actually to the limit, and this is where you have the base in archaeology. Okay. Yeah, building on that, for example, I mean, if you read the paper, this sort of uh, sketch in which you, uh, you uh, tackle the issue of uh, cultural transmission from a temporal, spatial, etc. point of view, um, um, if from a temporal point of view, you can learn something uh, in very different moments. So if you are a sun hunter gatherers, um, probably nobody will t teach you. Um, from the beginning, the type of wood that you use to produce your bow up to how to kill the animal. Because this also entails uh, what is the larva that you're using for the poison. There are three ingredients for the larva. You know, one is the larva itself, another is a wild asparagus that is a antidiuretic. So the animal will be the poison and won't be able to pee the poison. Okay. So this is the and the and the, 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 the wax that you use is that. so this means that the you won't get how to produce the old operation chain at the same moment. But this will be such a different moment in your life. And the piece of information will be given by your uncle and other by your father. So and it is very difficult without a mean of communication to uh, get all these different pieces. Because it will be difficult to understand why you have to look at somebody producing a poison in a moment in which it's doing and thinking that perhaps you will use in one year or two years uh, when the, for the first time you will be taken to hands with your father the old set of things that you have learned. So in, I would say that this is a strong argument for having a mean of communication, otherwise there will be no motivation uh, at looking at your father producing the poison when you don't see why, why it would be useful. Yeah. So technology could also be the complexity of technology and the fact that they are putting together many different steps. Uh, is also for me an yeah. important point in say, okay, you have to be in communication. Why this is important? Yeah, yeah. this is kind of you assume that it, you'll need to have already quite a complex language to do this, very complex forms of uh, well, instruction you, learning. It's a language interesting enough to explain why you should motivate it to look at somebody doing something. So you have to have a way to explain the final goal of why this is important. Yeah. And there are in papers, uh, you know, discussing this issue. Uh, but they were saying somebody else would say, okay, but, uh, no. For example, 
I mean, there is a paper in which the Japanese, uh, famous paper in which the Japanese uh, pro reproduce uh, with students uh, the Levalois technique, which is a technique used by Neanderthal. And they show that it was able to show the technique and uh, uh, for students to learn how to do it without uh, uh, talking to them. So the right, tools, but you still, <coughs> because humans still use language, they still have the cognitive capacity to understand stuff in language, even though, like, so, Let's Sometimes you don't have to say something in language to be understood in language. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, as a student, even if somebody is not talking to you, yeah. uh, you can understand from the context that if you are taken to a room to learn a technique, after perhaps you will have a better note, a better grade. So, I mean, it, it, it's not yeah. uh, this type of uh, undertaking as not necessarily... Um, but, I mean, you can learn a lot yeah. of stuff without yeah. people talking to you. I mean, they like breaking nuts, the chimps, etc. Right. But the chimps take a long, long time to, to learn how to break nuts. So without language, some cultural transmission are not so easy, even just, uh, you know, making a, 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 you know, a, take a, a stick to, to the fish, uh, thermite, etc. It's something that takes quite long. Um, so the I, I, I don't have... Uh, but my, you know, my my prediction is that Neanderthals were able to speak, uh, and okay. and that modern humans, in fact, were able to speak uh, with some form of advanced language, if it's not, uh, and that that then we met today at the long conversation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just to you better understand this argument from uh, anthropologists uh, with the example you gave about poison. If you, if you see example? the example you provide about like. Uh, Doing a, your, your father do a Python, why, why would you look at it if you don't know for what it is? But yeah. if your father is doing Python, then use it right away, you get all the information to actually acquire this code, don't you? Um, no, I'm not understanding what you're saying. You, you talk about the poison. Yeah, the poison yeah. thing, yeah. Well, what I understood from the, your, the, your argument was that uh, why would you look at your father uh, yeah. doing Python? if uh, he cannot explain to you with language what it is for. Right, particularly the, uh, the take. This poison also entails different steps. For example, this larva, you find the larva by digging with a digging stick uh, at the, in the roots of three uh, trees. So there are three species of trees that uh, have the larva, but you have to make a hole which is 60 centimeters deep. So it takes time. So there are all these, and perhaps you see somebody doing that, but uh, in order to spend your time to dig, uh, you have to understand the, what what is the final goal. And when you make the poison, you don't know that there are the way in which you would put the poison on your arrow. Mm. Uh, so yeah, this, this type of complexity, say, which you know, yeah. take different steps. Um, mm. You might be able to motivate people. It's not just uh, mo just of molding to break a nut, you know, with the chimps. Because you see the nut. You see the people eating the nut close by. So it's quite clear that you break the nuts to eat what's inside. So it's more about like the temporal aspect of it. Mm. But if it would be short, you could imagine you see your father uh, doing the steps for mm. doing the poison, then directly use it on an animal, it works. You get all the information. It's easy because you have to mm. find the, the stick to make the arrow, mm. uh, the, you have to prepare the bow, you have to uh, twist the, a type of fiber to finish the bow. Mm. Uh, you will uh, make another hole in a different place to get a root that you will uh, cut, and the root you will put it on the fire to get uh, the latex that will uh, help you to um, finalize the arrow. After you achieve the the tendon of a hoodoo, that will be allow you to finish the arrow. I mean, it's, it's a com very complex technology. He can learn it just by looking, and maybe it's just a social norm. It doesn't need to be language. Like this, the explanation why you need to do it, it could be inherited through social norms and not necessarily through language. Well, there there has been actually um, models that have been that have looked precisely at the role of imitation. And imitation, yes, it's actually a mean to um, get an innovation or a cultural trait to be transmitted amongst a group, but it is not that good when comes the time actually to um, uh, make sure that this cultural trait lasts in time. 
So the longer the time span from the beginning, like step one of the project, to, okay, my technological project is done, and now with this tool, I can get food, the, the more the time actually um, that you spend during that, the, um, the more chance you have to lose crucial information at crucial steps in this operational sequence, which if you try to imitate it afterwards, will lead you to failure, either because you will kill yourself because you didn't know how to process the larvae properly, or you will actually like miss shoot the animal and he will run into you and you will die again. So <laughs> you like the 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 more complex the, the, the point is yes, imitation can do something, but it can do only so much. If you're adding something like twenty five steps that are hap that have to happen over the course of three, four, five seasons in order to get your food, yeah. then language at this point, uh, imitation, it would be insufficient. Yeah. Would say the same, you could have the same argument, for example, for learning how to perform a musical piece. Well, probably not piano at this time, but let's say there is some musical instruments. And in that case, the functional, well, the function of it is not clear. So there is nobody that can tell you you have to play this functional piece because it will uh, allow you to better survive or whatever. And so this is why maybe the type of answer we have in the flower team to this type of, uh, of questions is more that there must be something in humans that makes us intrinsically motivated to learn new stuff, whatever it is, just for the pleasure of learning it. And which could explain actually why you would look at your father uh, doing the poison, even if it's complicated, because you are actually learning something which is intrinsically rewarding for yourself and which might be actually a special feature of our species. I, I guess the thing is not so much about motivation. I mean, you can be motivated to learn from your father, but if you can think symbolically, you will not get far into learning like a 15-step process, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we started talking about language, but actually the underlying question is like, could we think symbolically? So um, what I'm trying to say, like, let's imagine that you're learning this 15-step process without language. Um, the question is like, do you think symbolically? And we are assuming that the reason why we think symbolically is because we use language. Okay, so it's kind of a chicken on our neck problem, right? But yeah, even if it's a cultural norm, and even if it's not somebody explaining to you, first you do this, then you do this, then this is important because you have to prepare it like this. Um, yeah. Which is obviously all, mm. all very far fetched. But even if somehow you could do this, you still must have in your mind a representation of like, okay. This is a larva, it has to, to be, be like this, to... which can be put into this by this. You have to, I mean, you can just instinctively combine all these things uh, without separating it into categories. The language definitely helps. Yeah. At least because it allows you to abstract it in like a key few steps instead of retaining the long sequence of sociomotor motor interaction. In, in, I mean, in traditional societies, um, the use of all these different ingredients occur in a world in which uh, all the elements around you have names. So in, in society in which they have already ordered uh, the, the, the surrounding world, so each tree has a name. Um, so they have created a taxonomy of what's happening. And you need this taxonomy to know that this is the tree that, on which you will find the larvae, and this is not the tree, and so on. Um, so that's... Um, so, I mean, my approach, is, uh, the approach that we try to follow in that is when you see a, this, the different um, sketch, you know, the temporal dimension, the uh, uh, spatial dimension, the social dimension, let's try and look, for example, at the bow and arrow, say. In order to pass this to the following generation, if we look at these different dimensions, spatial, temporal, and social, what are the minimum requirements in order for this technique to be passed to the new generation? Okay, so he said, for example, you make a biface. Okay, perhaps you can produce the biface, but without really using language or really proto language, just to show. I mean, it's a relatively complex task, and, but you know, is it just one one sequence? All right. So, okay. But uh, do you 
can you learn how to produce a biphase just by distant observation? So you are making the biphase there, and I'm here. So I'm, I'm the capucin monkey looking at you, try to break this stuff. You can learn, and you see this, you know, this little monkey with a big drum base. Okay, but perhaps you can do it. But if I'm here and you are there producing on my face, I'm not able to learn how to produce it. Today. So in fact, even if you don't want to teach me, the proximate observation, probably with the intentionality of the maker, is necessary to learn how to produce it by face. Because you have to learn the aspect in which you are creating the point in which you will blow it, and in order to make the biphase, the bad biphase are made by turning continuously the biphase. So you make one blow on one side, one blow on the other side, otherwise you will be stuck. So all these have implications. So the idea is, for each of the cultural traits, what are the minimum requirements, and when you will have you know, a full picture, try to see. Uh, if you put this uh, chronologically, how things has moved, can you find the tipping point in which, in a sense, uh, some type of language has been used to, uh, and we don't see just in one culture, so, but in a number of cultures. So where there is a convergence where toward a proto-language or a convergence toward the phase in which you can teach something that nobody knows, and the last step is, you know, we are talking about the uh, existence of God. There is no God here, but we, something we cannot discuss without being here and having the language. So that will be, you know, we teach philosophy. It's a passing concept that nobody has ever seen. So the, the, from, from just the, the, the distant observation in which you learn something from somebody who is not caring what you are learning, up to the philosophy, there are all set of uh, possible minimum requirements. We, well, we can maybe end this here. <laughs> Long afternoon. <laughs> that was great. That was great. But, but uh, yeah, it was very interesting. It was cool. Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean it is, everything you presented is very interesting. But on, at the same time, of course, we are coming from different disciplines, different background. Uh, we have some transfer, uh, like Daniel, with a bit in, in the middle, I would say. Um, but the, the following step would be how, um, how um, start, I mean, putting to, but they, what puts us together is the interest for the same, for the same topic, you know, cultural evolution. So how putting together data and you know, idea coming from us and uh, methodologies and idea coming from you, we may try to address one issue in a, in a novel way. Uh, mm. So that uh, I think it would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and put together a sort of exploratory idea that we say, okay, by putting together data and uh, uh, we can tackle an issue, uh, mm. even, even if just in an exploratory way, something that has not been done in the past. Yeah. Actually, with reinforcement learning, we don't usually use data. Like we design the environment and the agents, and then everything is like such yeah. contrast. We don't. Could be a way to start the thing. We could incorporate some data, or at least uh, <coughs> try to well, to see how the results from simulation can match some properties of some data that are existing, as um, as we did, for example, in the the last slides of your presentation a bit. Well, in the quality paper at least. But yeah. So yeah, how, how can we proceed to try to think then about more like maybe a concrete thing we try to do together in the, in the future? Um, or we can at least start to share like some papers and stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by email and then, uh, then maybe look, you can come at some point also uh, to discuss the uh, ideas you are mentioning. Absolutely. Uh, Talk and we can spend some time together to discuss it uh, a bit further. Yeah. That'd be cool. There's the CNRS Agrila uh, project also that could ah, yeah. be the Métis, Nouvelle Frontière en Archaeologie. Ah, oui, c'est vrai. 
Okay. But uh, deadline is January 23rd or February? I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I mean, mm. let's think about it. Yeah, we can maybe yeah, we can think about it. Yeah. We could uh, after uh, RHDR we take one day and sit down together yeah. to celebrate and to <laughs> think about the next step. And they at the bar and thinking about <laughs> Yeah. But share your documents also with me uh, when you can. I will uh, we'll have a look. I can also send you mine. Absolutely. So it, it can be a way to find uh, to think about more concrete uh, things we could do together. Maybe there's like two directions. There's like using uh, like reinforcement learning or some other machine learning as a computational tool for studying hypotheses. Yeah. But also like uh, finding challenges that we currently have in, in, in AI, seeing like if, if they have been already uh, it's also like, um, if there's already existing hypothesis, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the two, so we are definitely directly in the two, the two directions, yeah. Well, at least from this meeting, what seems to stand out are the things that seem to be very strong between what uh, Luke and, uh, and Daniel are doing and, uh, and what you have presented, Danny. It seems that there are probably some interesting uh, relationships here and also maybe concrete experiments actually to be made. Uh, for example, on the questions you you wrote at the end of your presentation and what Daniel is doing also uh, with the data he has about like the different routes uh, between different uh, groups uh, that I think would be actually relatively easily incorporated in the model. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but at the end, maybe it's that was a metal structure, so it's a graph. Maybe. <laughs> so to, to see, yeah, to see. Yeah, this is all it is. That's fine. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Je vais vous dire un chat, c'est un truc qui arrive.